On December 2nd, Vice Admiral Fushizo Tiso Tahara, commander of the 11th Air Fleet, sent the first reconnaissance planes to the Philippines. On December 4th and 5, follow-up flights were conducted. The planes photographed Clack and Iba airfields and other military installations in the Manila area from an altitude of 20,000 feet. The photographs of Clark Air Base clearly showed 32 B-17 heavy bombers, three medium bombers, and 71 small airplanes. The Navy estimated that there were about 300 US aircraft of all types on Luzon. We later learned that this estimate was overestimated by a factor of two. It was not only our reconnaissance planes that were active. American PBY Catalina flying boats made repeated flights over Formosa. They usually took advantage of cloudy days and flew slowly at an altitude of only 1,500 feet, carefully photographing our airfields and fortifications. American pilots could only be amazed. They seemed easy prey on their lumbering, slow-moving airplanes, yet we failed to intercept a single PBY. As soon as the air raid alarm sounded, dozens of our pilots took to the air, but Catalina immediately dived into a dense cloud and invariably safely departed. Pictures taken by these scouts from low altitude should have told the Americans literally everything they wanted to know about our aviation. When we arrived in Tainan and joined the new air flotilla, we began another period of intensive training. All pilots were forbidden to leave the airfield. From dawn until late evening, seven days a week, in all weathers, we conducted training flights to learn how to cover bombers, to operate in large groups, to bomb ground targets and so on. The original plan to attack the Philippines was to use three light aircraft carriers to bring the Zeros closer to the enemy islands. They were the Ryujo. The Ryujo, the Zuiho and the converted merchant ship Taiho. Theoretically, these three aircraft carriers could base up to 90 fighters, but in reality they could not operate more than 50 aircraft. And on windy days that number was cut in half. Tsukahara decided that these ships would be almost useless for our missions. However, if the Zero could fly from Formosa to the Philippines and return without intermediate landings, the need for aircraft carriers would immediately disappear. The Admiral's aides not unreasonably doubted that a single-engine fighter would be able to fly combat sorties over such distances. Clark Airfield was at a distance of 450 miles from our airbase. Airfield Nicole, located near Manila, from the airbase Tainan, separated even 500 miles. Therefore, if we take into account the fuel reserve required for combat and the absolutely mandatory emergency reserve, we were required to make a non-stop flight of 1,000 to 1,200 miles. No fighter aircraft had ever flown such distances before. Therefore, even our command seriously feared that the Zero would not be able to do it either. There was only one way to resolve all doubts. From that moment on, we tried day and night to increase the range of our planes. Range aside, the Zero was designed to stay in the air for six to seven hours. We were able to stretch that time to 10 and even 12 hours, and for large group flights. I personally set a record for minimum fuel consumption, bringing it to 17 gallons per hour. Average pilots have reduced consumption from the standard 35 to only 18 gallons per hour. It should be recalled that the normal fuel reserve on the Zero was 182 gallons. To save gasoline, we flew at 115 knots at 12,000 feet. If you give the motor full power, the Zero would make 275 knots, and if you boosted the motor, it could even make 300 knots for a short period of time. During our ultra-long range flights, the propeller rotated at a speed of 1,700 to 1,850 revolutions per minute. The air supply to the cylinders was kept to the minimum required. This combination minimized engine power and fuel consumption, but we were constantly balancing on a razor blade. The motor could stall at any moment, and the airplane could corkscrew. These new methods of flight had increased the Zero's range to an unheard of figure. Our commanders reported this happy news to Admiral Tsukahara, and he immediately excluded three light aircraft carriers from his operational plans. Two of them returned to Japan, and one was transferred to support our operations in Palo. This left the 11th Air Fleet with no ships at all. We were very interested in what kind of resistance the Americans would be able to offer. We had little knowledge of their airplane types, and even less knowledge of the capabilities of American pilots. The only thing we were sure of 
was that we would face much more experienced pilots than those we had shot down in China. None of us wondered if it was wise to start a war. After all, we were all just non-commissioned officers who had been trained sometimes quite painfully to obey orders without question rather than ask questions. If we were ordered to fly and fight, we obediently did so. On December 8, 1941, at 02, double zero hours, a resident came running into our barracks in Hainan and brought up my group of pilots. X day had arrived. We knew that the first day of the war had begun. The pilots quietly put on their flight suits and quietly went outside. The sky was clear and moonless, with many stars twinkling across the firmament. The night silence was broken only by the squeak of gravel under our shoes and the soft voices of the pilots hurrying to the runway. Our commander, Captain First Rank Masahisa Saito, informed us that we should take off at four point double zero. He assigned a task to each link, which was to participate in the attack of American airfields in the Philippines. Now all we had to do was wait. The ordinaries brought us breakfast while we sat near our airplanes. However, around zero three double zero, fog began to descend on the airfield, which was extremely rare in the subtropics. By 4 a.m. the fog had become thick as milk and visibility was reduced to only five yards. The loudspeakers in the flight control tower blared, departure postponed indefinitely. The darkness gradually dissipated and we began to get more and more nervous. Three hours had passed and the fog was still not melting. Moreover, it became even denser. Suddenly the loudspeaker came to life again attention. There's an important message coming through the pilots fell silent, listening. At 06.00 this morning, a Japanese aircraft carrier formation launched a surprise crushing strike against American forces in Hawaii. The response was a wild, triumphant roar. The pilots danced, slapping each other on the backs, but not all of their cries were shouts of joy. Many of the pilots were letting out the tension they had accumulated. Moreover, there was now a fear that our planes, chained to the ground, will be the target of a retaliatory strike by the enemy. The American attack had become a factor to be reckoned with. The enemy now knew that we had launched an offensive, and it was unlikely that he would wait for us without complacency, sitting in the Philippines. Tension rose as dawn approached. The fog had completely confused our plans. Worse, it allowed the Americans to send their bombers from Luzon and strike our planes on the ground the moment the fog cleared. Our soldiers scattered to their battle stations. Anti-aircraft gunners loaded their guns with live shells, and all the people on the airfield, listening intensely, trying to distinguish the rumble of the engines of enemy bombers. But this raid for some reason did not take place. At 9.00 the fog began to slowly melt, and loudspeakers announced to us that the takeoff would take place in an hour. All fighter pilots and bomber crews took their places in the airplanes without waiting for further orders. Exactly at 10 point, double zero through the last wisps of fog sparkled lights, authorizing takeoff. One by one, the bombers began their run up along the long runway. One, two, three, six planes left the ground and began to gain altitude. The seventh plane had already run about 1,200 feet down the runway, gaining speed, when suddenly its right landing gear strut snapped. With a terrible grinding sound, the airplane ploughed through the ground with its belly. Flames immediately engulfed the entire fuselage. In its trembling light, we saw the pilots jump out of the hatches and ran as hard as they could away from their plane. The next moment, a terrible explosion shook the entire airfield at exploded bombs, killed the entire crew of the bomber. The emergency party in a matter of seconds arrived at the runway, People began to quickly pull apart twisted pieces of metal. Dozens of people began to fill in the smoking crater. Less than 15 minutes later, the next bomber was ordered to take off. By 10.45, all the planes were in the air 53 bombers and 45 Zero fighters. The fighters split into two groups. One stayed with the bombers as cover, and the rest flew forward to tie up the interceptors, which after the long delay of our attack would surely be up in the air. I flew as part of the first wave. We were going at an altitude of 19,000 feet. Shortly after the planes crossed the south shore of Formosa, I noticed a group of nine bombers flying below us toward Formosa. This must have been the enemy about to attack our airfields. 
The nine pilots, including myself, were ordered before departure to attack any enemy aircraft seen en route to Luzon, while the rest were to follow on. We left the formation and spun down on the bombers. After a few seconds I got into a comfortable attack position and began to close in on the lead bomber. I had already started to press the throttle when I suddenly realised that these were Japanese army planes. I immediately shook my wings to keep the other fighters from opening fire as well. But what kind of idiots are sitting in the bombers? No one in the army command did not even think to coordinate the actions of their aircraft with the fleet, and these morons were making a routine training flight. We took our place in formation as the group flew over the Bataan Islands, halfway between Formosa and Luzon. They were occupied by our parachutists shortly after we flew over there. These islands were supposed to be the emergency landing place for our airplanes on the return flight from the Philippines. But in reality, none of our pilots needed to do so. And then the Philippines showed up ahead a huge dark green mass on the blue of the ocean. We skimmed over the shore. Everything was quiet and peaceful, not a single enemy airplane in the sky. And some time later we were again over the South China Sea. At 1.35pm, we crossed the coastline again and headed straight for Clark Air Base. What we saw amazed us. It was impossible to believe. Instead of encountering a flock of American fighters rushing at us, we saw about 60 enemy bombers and fighters standing on the ground. They were tightly lined up along the airfield walkways. Just the perfect target. The Americans didn't even try to disperse the planes. We couldn't understand at all what the enemy was thinking. The attack on Pearl Harbor took place over five hours ago. The Philippines must have gotten word of it by now. The enemy should have expected that we would strike here at the most important airfields. We could not believe that American fighters were not waiting for us in the air. Finally, after several circles over the airfield, I did notice five American fighters at an altitude of about one five, triple zero feet, that is 7,000 feet below us. We immediately dropped our outboard tanks and all pilots took their guns and machine guns off the fuses. However, the enemy planes were in no hurry to attack us they kept at the same altitude. It was just stupid. But the American fighters continued to fly at an altitude of 15,000 feet, although we were above them. However, our orders forbade us to attack the enemy until the bombers arrived. At 1.45pm, 27 bombers escorted by a group of Zeros showed up in the north. They immediately laid down on a combat course to bomb the airfield. The attack was conducted in an exemplary manner. Bombs hail from the open hatches and rush to the ground. Bombardiers did not in vain long hours of studying aerial photographs. Their marksmanship was simply amazing. I will say more. For the whole war one have never seen such an accurate bombing. Literally the entire airbase went up in flames, lifted by the explosions of bombs. Pieces of airplanes, hangars and other structures tumbled in the air. Everywhere broke out the strongest fires, smoke fell. Having accomplished their task, the bombers turned around and flew back home. We escorted them for about ten minutes and then returned to Clark Airfield. The American base was trashed, shrouded in smoke, it was blazing like a huge bonfire. We circled at 13,000 feet, still meeting no resistance. Then came the order to fire on the base. I pushed the control stick forward and spiralled steeply toward the ground. My wingman stayed close, as if tethered by invisible threads. I targeted two intact B-17s standing on the runway. Our three fighters rained a barrage of bullets and shells on the huge bombers. We levelled off just above the ground and immediately went steeply upward. This is where we were caught by five American P-40 fighters. They were the first American airplanes I had ever encountered. I pushed the handle and pedals, throwing the airplane into a steep left turn, and then candled upward. This manoeuvre thwarted the enemy attack, and all five P-40s were left behind. Their formation fell apart. Four fighters dived into the column of black smoke rising above the airfield and disappeared. But the fifth plane turned left, thus making a mistake. If he had stayed with his comrades, he would have been able to take cover in the thick smoke. I immediately turned around and attacked the P-40 from below. The American made a half turn and began to swerve. At 200 yards the belly of his plane filled my sight. I pushed the throttle and got close to 50 yards.
The P-40 was trying desperately to turn away. He was already effectively dead. A short burst of my cannons and machine guns hit the cockpit, the lantern flew away. The enemy fighter seemed to freeze in the air for a moment and then jerked and flew to the ground. It was my third victory and the first American airplane shot down in the Philippines. I did not see any more enemy planes, but the other Zero pilots intercepted a group of Americans. In the evening, already in Tanana, after all the reports were studied, it was clear that we had shot down nine airplanes, four more were probably shot down, and 35 were destroyed on the ground. The anti-aircraft guns at Clark Airfield shot down one Zero, and four more crashed while landing at Formosa. However, we did not lose any aircraft in the air battles. On the second day of the war, December 9th, we had to endure our toughest battle with a storm that inflicted serious losses on our squadrons. Early in the morning, we took to the air and flew toward Luzon. The weather was so nasty that the bombers were forced to stay on the ground. The same storm was raging over the Philippines as over Formosa, so we managed to burn only a few enemy planes on the ground for the rest of the day. On the way back, a terrible rain squall swept the formation of the fighter group. The downpour was simply indescribable. A veritable waterfall, the likes of which I had never seen before, fell on the light fighters. The swirling masses of clouds seemed to descend to the ocean itself. Eventually we split into wedges of three fighters and each group flew home independently. From 15 or 20 yards up, the surface of the ocean looked horrible. It was all covered in clumping white foam. I had no other choice, having to fly at low altitude. Both of my wingmen clung to my tail, trying desperately not to lose sight of me. For several hours we flew northward, and the fuel supply dwindled and dwindled. And then, after an interminably long flight, the southern coast of Formosa glimmered in the breaks in the clouds ahead. We circled under the torrents of downpour until we spotted an army airfield not far from the coast. We barely had enough fuel to land on a spreading runway. Thirty other fighters made it to Formosa, and it was later learned that three more planes made an emergency landing on a small island near the Army airfield. However, there was no loss of life to any of the pilots. In the evening we got our first real rest in the last three months since arriving on Formosa. A dingy hotel in a small rural village seemed like paradise to us. We wrapped ourselves in blankets and fell soundly asleep. I will remember the third day of the war for a long time, as it was the day I shot down my first B-17. It was also the first flying fortress lost to the Americans in combat. I learned after the war that this bomber was piloted by Capt. Colin P. Kelly, one of America's heroes. We didn't fly out to Luzon until 10, because all the fighters had to get to Tainan first to regroup, refuel and get new orders. 27 Zeros took off from Tainan, over Clark Airfield we found no targets. For 30 minutes we circled over the burned-out American base, but failed to spot any aircraft in the air or on the ground. The group then turned north to cover a Japanese convoy landing at Wigan. Yanagara-type light cruiser and four destroyers escorted the four troop transports. American reports, based on the reports of surviving pilots from the crew of Captain Kelly, greatly exaggerated the number of ships. If you believe the Americans, our connection consisted of the battleship Haruna, six cruisers, ten destroyers and fifteen to twenty transports. We managed to stay above the transports for about twenty-five minutes, circling at eighteen thousand feet, when I noticed three large circles on the water near the ships. We were too high up to distinguish the water columns from the bomb blasts, but those three circles were telling. It was immediately apparent that none of the ships had been hit although American reports said it looked as if the non-existent battleship had received one direct hit and two close bursts before being enveloped in smoke and moving away, dragging a trail of oil behind it. My comrades and myself were outraged that the enemy attacked despite the presence of fighter cover. We hadn't even noticed the bombers. I started fidgeting in the cockpit and after a few seconds I saw a single B-17 flying south 6,000 feet above us. I did my best to draw the attention of the rest of the Pschutz to this bomber, and we started looking for other planes that were probably also involved in the attack. We had never seen an unaccompanied bomber attack before, especially an attack by a single bomber in an area where it was certain to meet our fighters. Incredible but true.
a single B-17 attacked a target right in the jaws of our fighters. This pilot had courage in abundance. Our leader ordered to catch up with the American, and we all rushed after him, not counting the three fighters left to cover the transports. The B-17 turned out to be unexpectedly fast, and only by giving full throttle we managed to get closer to the firing range. About 50 miles north of Clark Airfield we began manoeuvring to attack the bomber. Suddenly out of nowhere three Ols appeared and sped right in front of the B-17. They must have been from the Calcion Air Regiment that had shelled the Nicollet Airfield a little earlier. We had not yet gotten close to the bomber when these three fighters turned around and made approaches on the bomber one by one. The B-17 nonchalantly continued to fly on, as if the Zeros were nothing more than a flock of gnats. In thin air, at 22,000 feet it had a slight advantage, as the Zeros' performance was noticeably reduced here. Seven of our fighters joined the trio from Cao Xi'an, and all together they repeated the attack. It was simply impossible to organise a joint attack of ten fighters against a single bomber. In thin air, we could easily have lost control and collided with a comrade. Instead, we lined up in a long column and made approaches one after the other, taking turns shelling the enemy. This was time-consuming and annoying, as we had to wait a long time for our turn. When all ten zeros had conducted their attacks, we were simply amazed. It seemed that not a single bullet or shell had hit a bomber. This was our first encounter with a B-17, and the unusual size of the bomber caused us to misjudge the distance. In addition, the unusually high speed of the B-17 made it incorrect to take an incorrect lead that we were taking. All the while the Flying Fortress was firing off all of its onboard machine guns. Fortunately, the enemy gunners were no more accurate than we were. After my approach I noted that we were already over Clark Airfield, and it was clear that the American pilot had called in his fighters for help. We had to shoot him down quickly if we didn't want to fall into the trap ourselves. But it made no sense at all to continue the approach, diving at the bomber from behind. I decided to get close to it. I was fortunate that the first B-17s did not have a tail turret, in which case I would not have been able to fly in a straight line. Giving full throttle, I joined the tail of the bomber and began to approach. Both my wingmen pulled closer, and just like that, wing to wing, we went on the attack. The fortress machine guns were firing continuously, and the pilot kept turning slightly from side to side to give the gunners a chance to catch us in their sights. But in spite of his best efforts, the enemy tracks were flying past. I moved out a little ahead of my comrades and opened fire. From the right wing of the bomber began to fly off pieces of metal, then appeared a thin white jet. Most likely it was gasoline from the punctured tank, but it could have been smoke. I kept firing at the damaged area, hoping to interrupt the gasoline line or air system with the cannon shells. Suddenly the trickle turned into a fountain. The bomber's machine guns stopped firing. It seemed to me that a fire had started inside the fuselage of the B-17. I could not continue the attack as I had used up my ammunition. I turned to the left so that the Zero behind me could take its chance. The pilot pounced on the tail of the B-17 like a hungry man, putting a long stream of shells and bullets into it. The bomber was badly damaged, and before the rest of the fighters came up, it pecked its nose and began to descend sharply. Strangely enough, its wings did not fly off, and it went perfectly straight without losing control. It looked like its pilot had decided to make an emergency landing at Clark Airfield. I swooped down to follow the damaged fortress and pulled out my lacquer. I managed to take three or four pictures. At 7,000 feet, three men jumped out of the bomber. Three parachutes opened, and the next moment the B-17 dived into a cloud and disappeared. We later learned that the Americans accused our pilots of shooting people who were descending on parachutes with machine guns. It was pure propaganda. My Zero was the only one near the bomber when the pilots started to leave, and I didn't fire a single shot. I only clicked my camera. No Japanese pilot saw the B-17 crash, so we were not credited with the victory at that time. At night we had a long talk about the brave B-17 pilot who single-handedly tried to attack our squadron. We had never heard of anything like that before. A single airplane was virtually doomed when faced with so many enemy fighters.
the inaccuracies in the reports of the surviving pilots in no way detracted from their heroism. When we returned to Formosa in the evening, we found the wings of two O's riddled with bullets fired by the fortress gunners. Thirteen years after that battle, I met American Air Force Colonel Frank Kurtz, who had flown the famous Suwashi bomber during the raid on Tokyo. Kurtz told me, the day Ko Lin was shot down, I was in the flight control tower at Clark Airfield. I saw his plane approaching, and you were correct in stating that he was trying to land. The three open parachutes descended into a cloud that was at about 2,500 feet, I thought. Then five more parachutes opened. At least I thought I saw five. But alas, Colin never came back. In the evening I received some letters from home and a small package from Fujiko. She had sent me a cotton belt with a thousand red stitches. It was a traditional Japanese talisman against enemy bullets. Fujiko wrote, Today we were told that our motherland has started a great war against the United States and Great Britain. We can only pray for our ultimate victory and for your good fortune in battle. Hatsuo-san and I stood for days for many hours at a time on a street corner and begged 998 women who passed by to do one stitch each on your belt. Therefore, on your belt, every stitch was made by another woman. We wish you to wear it, and we will pray that it will protect you from the shells of the enemy's guns. In reality, few of the Japanese pilots believed in the efficacy of this amulet, but I knew what it had cost Fujiko and my cousin to stand for long hours in the cold winter wind to put together 1,000 stitches. Of course I would wear it, and immediately wrap the belt around my waist. Fujiko's letter got me thinking that night, for the first time I thought of the enemy pilots I shot down as human beings, not just faceless appendages to their airplanes. It was a strange and depressing feeling, but alas, such is the nature of war kill, or be killed yourself. For the next ten days we continued our routine sorties from Formosa to the Philippines, and then received orders to relocate to Jolo on the island of Sudu, halfway between Luzon and Borneo. This meant a 1,200-mile flight from Tainan Airfield. On December 30th at 09, double zero hours I took to the air with 26 other fighters to make this long journey to the new airfield. Here, however, a new order awaited us, and we flew another 270 miles south to the town of Tarakan on the east coast of Borneo. Our flight was completely calm. We did not meet a single enemy aircraft. For the first time, the enemy attacked our air bases in January. One night, a single B-17 took by surprise the units based in Tarakan. A series of bombs hit the newly built temporary barracks, which turned out to be a perfect target for the invisible raider. The construction workers had foolishly neglected to black out the barracks. The bombs killed over 100 men, wounded many, and destroyed several structures. Not a single zero took to the air, for the Tarakan airfield was one of the meanest in the whole of the East Indies. Its runways were constantly covered with slippery mud, so conducting flights was always a risk. On the day of our arrival, two O's flew off the runway on landing and had to be ridden off. After the bombing, the base commander was furious and ordered me and naval aviator First Class Kuniyoshi Tanaka to patrol the airfield at night. Tanaka had previously fought in China, where he became an ace, shooting down 12 enemy planes, and then in the Pacific he shot down eight more planes. He flew until he was severely wounded and was written off from aviation. Night flying was both difficult and dangerous. In those days our Zero fighters had absolutely no equipment for night operations. Neither Tanaka nor I were sure that we would even be able to attack enemy bombers if they appeared. Fortunately for us, and for the airbase we were no longer disturbed. On January 21st, one of our convoys left Tarakan Harbour and headed for Balikpapan in southern Borneo to land there. Headquarters ordered our air group to provide air cover, but we could only keep a handful of fighters in the air over the vulnerable transports. Instead of the huge number of fighters we had been promised, we had less than 70 zeros in the entire vast expanse of the East Indies in early 1942. Since many of the planes were in repair, having sustained battle damage or having exhausted their 150 flying hours, we had an average of about 30 fighters available to take off on the first order. In mid-January, B-17s began arriving at the enemy air base at Malang, Java, and immediately began attacking our forces in the Philippines, 
and throughout the East Indies. These planes seriously worried our troops on the islands, but they were still too few to stop our advance. On January 24th, in the pre-dawn twilight, we received another clear proof that the Zero was totally unsuited for night action. American ships attacked a Japanese convoy near Balik Papan. The attack was carried out perfectly. The enemy destroyers sunk torpedoes, several transports. And of course, we were unable to provide air cover, and the American ships went safely into the open sea. Even then, when dawn broke, we were able to send to Balik Papan only three airplanes. In the spring of 1942, new B-17s appeared in the Pacific Theater of Operations, which had a tail machine gun turret. So far, our favorite method of attacking these huge planes had been a gentle dive from behind and shelling the entire fuselage from tail to nose. We quickly discovered that such attacks were almost harmless to the solidly built and well-armored B-17. It was the recognition of this fact, not the appearance of a tail machine gun point on the bomber, that forced us to change tactics. Now we switched to frontal attacks, moving directly toward the B-17. We tried to put as many shells as possible into the front of the fuselage. This worked for a while, and then the B-17 pilots began to perform evasive maneuvers, and when turning around, our fighters came under fire from numerous onboard machine guns. The last method of attack, which proved to be the most effective, was that the fighter gained high altitude and vertically dive on the bomber, continuously firing. On the afternoon of January 24th, Tanaka returned to Tarakan with two of my wingmen after a patrol over Balikpan. All three were terribly exhausted, although no one had received even a scratch. Tanaka reported that late in the morning his trio of fighters had encountered eight flying fortresses that were coming in two compact groups. Tanaka grumbled something unbelievable happened today. We calmly attacked the fortresses time after time. I shot them several times, at least twice I must have hit them. I could clearly see the bullets hitting the target and the shells bursting inside the fuselage. But they weren't falling. Tanaka even shivered with chagrin. It's simply impossible to shoot down these bombers, especially when they're in a defensive formation he almost spat. But then he added that their attacks did disrupt the bombing, as the B-17s hurriedly dropped almost their entire cargo into the open sea. Only one large tanker was hit, which was burning brightly as Tanaka flew away from Balikpam back to the airfield. The next day I was on patrol off Balikpapan myself. My wingman was naval aviator second-class Sadao Yuhara. Only two zeros were all we could scrape together at our base to cover the convoy. The rest of the fighters were needed elsewhere. As Tanaka met the B-17 at 20,000 feet, we slowly described wide circles at 22,000 feet. Tanaka had no time to gain altitude to intercept the bombers before they began dropping bombs. Far below, the tanker set on fire the day before continued to blaze like a torch. Late in the morning several dots appeared in the sky, moving from the direction of Java. They quickly approached and grew in size, gradually turning into two groups of bombers of four airplanes each. The fortresses flew in two links as Tanaka had met them the day before. The rear link held a little higher than the head link, and when we approached it further closed the formation, forming a dense box. The B-17s flew a half mile below me. I flipped over the wing, Yuhara held close as if glued, and we dived at the bombers. The range was still too great, but I gave the line nonetheless. I saw the airplanes begin to drop their bombs in a hurry immediately afterward. We turned around and went steeply upward. On the water I noticed huge diverging circles. There were no hits, all the ships of the convoy were intact. Once above the B-17s, which described a wide arc and lay on a reverse course, we began to look for a second wave of bombers, which could well follow the first. But the sky was clear. I again took the initial position for the attack half a mile above the trailing formation. Now I could see what Tanaka was up against. I moved the control stick forward and threw the fighter into a dive. The airplane was gaining speed rapidly. I gripped the handle tightly, holding the plane in a prolonged gentle dive, opening fire with machine guns and cannons, to no avail. Fortresses grew in size, filling, it seemed, the entire sky. Machine gun trails flashed around me as we cut through the American formation. We took no hits, and I began gaining altitude again to repeat the attack.
Again Pike, withdrawal, firing at one bomber. This time I hit it. I could see the shells tearing. A chain of black and red puffs ran down the fuselage. Now it would surely crash down. Pieces of metal, big sheets of metal, flew off the bomber and tumbled in the turbulent jet. The lower and upper turrets went silent after these hits. And nothing. No fire, no smoke tail. The B-17 held firmly in formation. We turned around and gained altitude, then began the third approach. The enemy formation seemed impenetrable, as if nothing was happening. The third time I fired at the already attacked bomber, and again I got several hits. Through the scope I could see the shells tearing through the metal on the wings and fuselage. I sped past the bomber, made a gentle turn and began to gain altitude again. The airplane still kept its place in the formation. No fire, no smoke. Every time we rushed at the enemy bombers, their gunners opened frantic fire. But they were hampered by the fact that their planes were flying too close to each other. That's why my Zero didn't get any hits. Then I repeated the attack twice more, coming out of the dive with a flip. Yuhara kept my right. Each time we took fire from cannons and machine guns, each time we saw our shells and bullets hit the target, there and each time without any visible effect. We had already completed our sixth run when the eight B-17s split into two links. Four airplanes turned to the right and the other four to the left. Yuhara waved excitedly, pointing to the four that had turned right. A thin black trickle pulled from the left engine of the third bomber. We'd gotten him after all. I turned around to catch up with the four and moved the throttle sector all the way up again, quickly catching up with the damaged plane. It was really badly damaged and was now starting to fall behind the other three cars. As I approached, I saw that the tail turret was smashed, its machine guns silent. At top speed, I came within 50 yards and pushed the throttles down. Each of my shells, each of my bullets hit the target. Suddenly, a cloud of black smoke billowed out of the fuselage. It pecked its nose and went down, hiding behind a layer of thick clouds. Back at Tarakan, I reported the details of the battle to my commanding officer, LT, Shingo. The rest of the pilots gathered around and listened as I recounted my repeated approaches to the target. In their opinion, I had just miraculously made it back as I was being machine gunned by eight flying fortresses at once. However, the mechanics who serviced my plane found only three bullet holes in the wing console. I was never a superstitious person, but still involuntarily touched the talisman sent by Fujiko. The higher-ups credited me with probably shooting down the airplane. But two days later, a Japanese reconnaissance plane reported that it had found a B-17 that had made an emergency landing on a small island between Balikpapan and Surabaya dot a few years after the end of the war. I read the famous work of Rear Admiral Samuel Elliott Morrison's history of American fleet operations in World War II. Morrison once again proved himself to be a very eloquent author, and his multi-volume book is based on many documents. Unfortunately, one piece of the war effort he describes with virtually no reliance on facts. I am speaking of our seizure of the Dutch East Indies, especially its main bastion, Java. In the Admiral's view, we won victories in this campaign through surprise and brute force, rather than skill. In particular, it is worth recalling the defeat of the Allied fleet in February 1942. Not only Morrison, but a new generation of American historians stubbornly refuses to include details of the major air battle in their documented works. Since we were only non-commissioned officers, of course my view of the events will be narrower than that of an admiral who saw the big picture of the entire war. However, my personal recollections of the events of the February campaign may prove useful to those who will study the Pacific War. The Java campaign effectively ended on February 26th, when Japanese ships defeated an Allied squadron near the island. A major factor in deciding the outcome of the battle was the Allied ship's lack of air cover, although it was absolutely necessary. But I have not read in any American work that Allied aircraft were destroyed on February 19th in a fierce air battle over Surabaya, involving nearly 75 fighters on both sides. It was the largest air battle to that date. It was the victory in the largest fighter duel, and not the strikes of our bombers on enemy airfields, deprived the Allied ships of air cover, which was the cause of their deaths.
On February 4th, 1942, along with other Zero pilots, I flew to Balikpapan airfield. The next day we began patrolling over the battle area. The clashes immediately became fierce as the enemy aircraft acted aggressively. Official Japanese documents state that my next victory was on February 5th, when we had several skirmishes with enemy planes. The following week our reconnaissance planes reported that the enemy had concentrated 50 to 60 fighters Curtis P-36 Mohawk, Curtis P-40 Tomahawk and Brewster F-2A Buffalo in the Surabaya area. They were to interfere with our landing on Java. Our command ordered all fighters available in the East Indies to be concentrated at Balikpan. On the morning of February 19th, 23 fighters, assembled from the Hainan and Kaohsiung Air Corps, flew to Surabaya. This was the first time we knew for sure that we would meet resistance from enemy fighters. We were to fly 430 miles to this Dutch fortress, where numerically superior enemy forces were waiting for us. However, all pilots were only waiting for a new victory, as it had been in the Philippines. All necessary measures were taken to ensure a safe flight. Several islets were selected for emergency landings, where our ships were waiting for pilots who would be forced to land. Ahead of the group flew weather scouts who were constantly transmitting reports. A fast reconnaissance plane led the fighters while also acting as forward guard. We arrived at Surabaya at 11.30, holding an altitude of 16,000 feet. An unheard of large enemy force awaited us. At least 50 Allied fighters were circling counterclockwise at an altitude of over 10,000 feet, covering the city. The enemy planes stretched out in a long column of three large wedges. The enemy had more than double numerical superiority. Noticing the enemy fighters, we dropped our outboard tanks and began to gain altitude. As soon as the Allies saw our formation, their fighters stopped spinning in place and rushed at us. They were ready for battle and eager to fight, unlike the American fighters we encountered on December 8th over Clark Air Force Base. In a matter of seconds our clear formation broke apart and a frantic scramble ensued. I spotted a P-36 flying toward me and executed a steep left turn, waiting for the enemy to react. The fool continued to fly in a straight line. Just what I needed. I threw the zero into a steep right turn, literally putting the fighter on the wing, and found myself right on the tail of the confused P-36 pilot. A quick glance back helped to make sure that there was no one behind me, and I went for a close approach with the enemy fighter. He turned right, but a light touch on the control stick kept the zero on his tail. From a distance of 50 yards I opened fire with cannons and machine guns. Almost immediately the right wing of the P-36 broke off and flew away, tumbling in the air jet. Then the left wing broke off. The P-36 flew downward, spinning rapidly, but immediately fell to pieces. The pilot never jumped out. I began gaining altitude with the turn, but also looked back to watch the battle unfold. At least six planes were falling to the ground engulfed in flames. The fighters were running back and forth like mad. An olive-coloured P-36 suddenly turned toward me. I also turned toward him, but then another Zero, which was moving upward in a steep candle, put a long cannon line into the P-36 and immediately turned away, because the Dutch plane exploded. On my left, the R-40 began to tail the fleeing Zero, and I turned abruptly, trying to get the enemy plane. But there was no need for that. Zero made a quick loop and was above and exactly behind the P-40. His guns and machine guns rumbled, and the P-40 burst into flames. Another P-40 was already coming down, leaving behind it a tail of flame three times as long as the fighter itself. Some P-36 was tumbling haphazardly in the air. Apparently its pilot had been killed, and the plane had lost control. Our unarmed scout below me transmitted by signal searchlight that he was being attacked by three Dutch fighters. The Japanese pilot manoeuvred frantically to dodge the enemy tracks blazing around his machine. Once again I was too late. Some Zero spun steeply toward the enemy, and its cannon line blew up the fuel tank of the overhead Dutch fighter. Coming out of the dive, the Zero went up in a candle, and in doing so attacked the second P-36 from below. The wing flew off immediately. The third pilot tried to turn around to meet the Zero. Too late, his lantern exploded in a firework of glass spatter, 
Another zero flew by me. Its pilot waved at me and smiled broadly, then disappeared, escorting the scout to safety. Our P-36 fighter sped over me, obviously trying to get out of the fight. I moved the throttle sector forward sharply and jerked the control stick toward me to catch up with the Dutchman. Still gaining altitude, I opened fire with the cannons, but I was in a hurry. The overload on the turn made me miss. This line frightened the enemy pilot. P-36 sharply laid on the left wing and vertically spiked to the ground. I was inside his turn and threw myself down as well. The Dutch fighter flashed less than 50 yards from me. I involuntarily squeezed the throttle and several shells hit the target. A thick tail of black smoke followed the enemy fighter. I gave two more turns and turned away as the flames engulfed the Dutch plane. A zero with two blue stripes on the fuselage flew 200 yards in front of me. All of a sudden this fighter turned into a ball of flame. That's how LT. Makawa Sai, our squadron commander, died. I still don't know what caused the explosion. Back at 8,000 feet I spotted about 20 zero fighters circling in a single formation. The few surviving Dutch fighters had turned into rapidly diminishing black dots. They were getting away. The fight was over just six minutes after it began. Strangely enough, the Dutch anti-aircraft batteries continued to remain silent, even though there were now no more of their planes in the air. We continued to circle over the city, waiting for the appearance of the remaining zeros that might rush out in pursuit of the Dutch. While our fighters were making slow circles, I flew over the narrow strait separating Surabaya from Madura Island and spotted a well-camouflaged airstrip. I slowly descended, marked on the map the location of the airfield, located near Jombang on the west coast of Madura. We had no idea of the existence of this secret airfield, so intelligence would be grateful to me for the information. I was just starting to gain altitude to join my own when I saw a single P-36 below me, the plane was flying almost over the very rooftops of the city. It was too tempting a target. The enemy pilot was flying slowly, at cruising speed, unaware of my approach. However, my impatience prevented an easy victory. I pressed the gun's throttle at too great a distance. The Dutch pilot spotted the track and immediately threw the plane down, trying to get away with the speed gain. Cursing my own stupidity, I hit the throttle section and pushed the handle forward to catch up with the P-36. But I had given the enemy pilot a precious advantage. The P-36 was far inferior to our fighters in terms of flight characteristics. Zero had higher speed, maneuverability, rate of climb, more powerful armament. However, the Zero was never intended to dive at high speed, and my premature firing allowed the P-36 to extend its range to 200 yards. I could not shorten it. The enemy pilot would have had a good chance of escape if he had had a margin of altitude. However, the proximity of the ground forced him to stop diving and switch to horizontal flight. Now, I could exploit the Zero's superior speed. The Dutchman manoeuvred desperately trying to get out of my sight, but every time he turned I was inside his turn, closing the distance between the planes. He was flying lower and lower, trying to escape. Now the enemy plane was almost hitting trees and houses. Probably his pilot hoped that the lack of fuel would force me to stop the chase. And I was very close to it. In a last ditch effort to catch up with the enemy, I turned on the afterburner when Malang Air Base appeared ahead. From 50 yards away, I took aim at the cockpit of a P-36 and pulled the trigger. The cannon magazines were empty, but the two machine gun bursts cut the enemy pilot to pieces. The fighter crashed into a rice paddy and rolled over on its back. I was the last of the pilots to join the group circling at 13,000 feet, 20 miles north of Madura. We lost LT. Asai and two other pilots. After returning to Balikpan, the pilots claimed to have shot down and probably downed a total of 40 enemy fighters. I have always been inclined to consider this figure overstated by 20 or 30 percent, which is perfectly natural after such a hot battle as we fought over Suraba Aya. In the chaos of a general battle, two or three pilots might fire on one airplane at the same time, and each would claim that it was he who shot down that airplane. However, that day the exaggerations were probably quite small, because we met almost no more resistance from Dutch fighters.
and then we were lucky once more. On the basis of my report, the command sent bombers to attack the secret airbase at Jombang. A surprise raid caught the enemy fighters P-40s, Buffaloes, British Hurricanes on the ground, and they were destroyed by bombs. The next day we returned to Java to attack enemy fighters that would appear in the air and bomb suitable targets on the ground. The enemy anti-aircraft guns, which had been silent the day before, now opened heavy fire and we lost three O zeros out of 18. Every night we heard the Allies report over the radio that they had shot down five or six Zero fighters in combat during the day. This was very funny, as only our air group flew the Zeros in the East Indies, and our heaviest losses were on February 19th and 20, when we lost six planes and pilots. On February 25th, 18 Zeros flew out of Balikpapan with orders to attack Malang Air Base. Our intelligence believed that the Allies had moved surviving bombers there to prevent us from landing on the island. On the way to Malang, we encountered a Dutch seaplane. I went out of formation, attacked it, and it crashed into the sea. If the Dutch had any fighters left at Malang, they refused to take the fight this time. We circled over the airfield for six minutes, and then our commander dropped down to fire on three B-17 bombers standing on the strip. The anti-aircraft fire was heavy, but we saw all three bombers go up in flames. The Dutch anti-aircraft guns poked holes in several zeros, but none were shot down. My next victory, which officially counts as my 13th, was on the last day of February. I flew as part of a group of 12 fighters that escorted 12 Betty bombers that flew out of Makassar to attack the Allies who had begun evacuating from Chilakapa. The enemy ships had left the harbour before we arrived, so the fighters circled aimlessly in the air while the bombers destroyed port facilities. The attack went smoothly, and after escorting the bombers back to the Java Sea, we turned toward Malang in search of enemy planes. On this day we were lucky. There were four fighters of a type unknown to us circling over the airbase. They kept close to a huge cumulus cloud that rose to a height of 25,000 feet. As we flew closer, we identified the enemy planes as Dutch buffaloes. I have never understood why some Dutch pilots show such carelessness. Before they even realised there was an enemy nearby, one of the Zeros blasted the buffalo with a long burst. I rushed at the second fighter, which entered a steep turn. He wanted to fight. I easily fit inside his turn, putting the fighter on the wing, and was 200 yards away from the enemy plane. I rarely fired during a turn, but this time I impatiently pressed the throttle. Several bullets hit the engine of the buffalo, and black smoke billowed from the airplane. Apparently the pilot was also wounded, because the fighter swung slowly from wing to wing several times and dived into the clouds. It is quite impossible for a damaged fighter plane to resist the swirls inside a thunderstorm cloud, but I never saw this plane go down. So I was only credited with a probable victory. For several months we flew from one airbase to another, we returned to the Philippines and started supporting the army that was still besieging Corregidor. Then our squadron was moved to the south of the island of Bali to prepare for the next major operation to the south. I have never understood American descriptions of air combat of that period. Particularly bizarre is a report by LT. Cole. Jack D. Dale, who claimed that his P-40 squadron shot down 75 Japanese planes while losing only nine pilots in 45 days of fighting in Java. These are absolutely fantastic figures because our total losses during that time amounted to only nine zeros. If Dale is to be believed, his P-40 pilots used a serpentine pattern, descending to about 6,000 feet when they encountered a zero and then regaining altitude. He claimed that this resulted in his 16 fighters being mistaken for 48 by the enemy. In all my fights against American P-40 fighters, I never once saw a manoeuvre like the one described by LT. Cole. Dale. In battles against the P-40, which was literally inferior to the Zero in all characteristics, every battle ended with a decisive victory for our pilots. Even more strange looks another passage from Dale's report. One night Tokyo Radio reported, hundreds of P-40s attacking everywhere. It's a new Curtis fighter armed with six guns. Katsutaro Kamiya, who was in charge of shortwave broadcasts for English-speaking listeners at the time, told me that no one had broadcast such a message. Kamiya added that there was simply no need for it, 
Since our troops were winning constant victories at the time, LT, Cole, Dale's report of his air victories is no more true than Captain Kelly's sinking of the battleship Haruna. In early March 1942, the 150 pilots of the Hainan Fighter Air Corp, who had been scattered throughout the Philippines and Indonesia, came together again on the island of Bali in the East Indies. A complete takeover of Indonesia had already become utterly inevitable. The Japanese occupation force on the island consisted of only one infantry company. The term occupation is not quite appropriate here, as the Japanese found the local population of the island to be friendly to them. Bali seemed like paradise. The weather was perfect and the island looked the most beautiful I had ever seen in the Pacific. Everything around our airfield was covered with lush vegetation, and we were delighted by the hot springs that ran among the rocks. As we were temporarily confined to the ground, we decided to indulge in some entertainment for a while. One afternoon we were sitting in our club when we heard the rumble of the engines of an approaching heavy bomber. This alarmed us. One of the pilots ran to the window and immediately flinched back, eyes bulging. Hey, it's a B-17. And it's coming in for a landing. We rushed to the window, crowding around it. It was, though it couldn't be. The giant flying fortress had released its landing gear and flaps and dropped the throttle to make it easier to land. I rubbed my eyes. This was just a hallucination. Where did that airplane come from? But everything was happening in reality. The plane landed, bouncing slightly as the wheels touched the ground. The screech of brakes hit our ears. At the same second we rushed to the door, excited at the prospect of getting a detailed look at the formidable American bomber. There was only one way this plane could land here it had been captured by us. But the crackle of machine guns stopped us. Someone shouted American soldiers the B-17 had not been captured. Its pilot had landed on our airfield by mistake, and some fool had fired on it before the plane had even finished its run. The machine gun had barely had time to fire a dozen shots before all four of the bomber's engines roared to life, and it was as if thunder rumbled over the airfield. The B-17 rushed down the runway and disappeared in a cloud of dust as the pilot lifted it into the air and then disappeared into the distance. We stood stunned. A perfectly serviceable B-17 had come right into our hands, and such an incredible opportunity had been missed only because the cretin behind the machine gun had suddenly gotten itchy. We ran in droves to the infantrymen's positions. A few pilots were barely holding back. One non-commissioned officer completely lost his temper. What kind of fucking idiot and son of a bitch fired a machine gun? He yelled. An imperturbable sergeant came up from behind the barricade. What's the matter? It was an enemy airplane. We have orders to shoot down enemy planes, not salute them. We had to hold the pilot. Turned white with anger, he might well have finished off SGT. An infantry lieutenant heard the shouting and came running to find out what was going on. When he was told the whole story, he bowed low and could only say one thing I don't know how to apologise for the stupidity of my soldiers. For the next few days we did nothing but rant at the army and curse the loss of a priceless trophy. Today, of course, this incident causes only laughter. But in 1942, the Flying Fortresses were our most formidable opponent of all Allied aircraft. A week later, tense relations between the Navy pilots and the Army garrison heated up even more. During this time we did not make combat sorties and gradually began to lose patience. This tense situation one night culminated in an explosion when I, lying in bed, lit a cigarette, completely forgetting about the blackout. Immediately someone outside shouted, Stop smoking, you stupid bastard. Aren't you familiar with the order? Airman Third Class Honda, who was lying next to me, jumped to his feet and rushed to the door. He immediately grabbed the soldier by the throat, loudly swearing. My wingman Honda was used to acting quickly, and sharply if only something threatened me. I ran after him, but I was too late. Honda lost control of himself, and before I could get to him, there was the sound of a hard kick, followed by a thud as the unconscious soldier collapsed to the ground. Honda went berserk. He ran away from the barracks and stood on the grass, shouting with all his might, Come out, you army bastards. It's me, Marine Airman Honda. Come out and fight, you scumbags.
Two soldiers jumped out of their barracks and threw themselves at Honda. I saw him smile, turn around, and with a joyous yell pounced on them. There was a scuffle, more blows, and then Honda rose to his feet. He stood with a look of triumph over the two defeated bodies. Honda. Stop that I shouted, but to no avail. More soldiers came running out of the barracks. A happy Honda started a new battle. But an infantry lieutenant came running after his soldiers and chased them back. He didn't say a word to us, but we could hear him scolding the soldiers. You should be fighting the enemy, you idiots. Not with your own countrymen. And if you start fighting, pick your opponent according to your strength. These are pilots. Every one of them is a samurai, and there's nothing better for them than a fight he hissed. The next morning the lieutenant came to our club, and we inwardly tensed up, expecting to be caught up for our behaviour. However, the lieutenant smiled and said, Gentlemen, I am happy to give you some pleasant news. Our army unit at Bandung in Java has captured a perfectly serviceable B-17 bomber. We roared. A B-17 in airworthy condition. The lieutenant waved his hands, asking for silence. Unfortunately, Tokyo has ordered the bomber to be sent to Japan immediately. I did not receive word of the hijacking until after the bomber left for the metropolis this morning. Disappointed cheers and curses greeted this message. The lieutenant hastily added, I assure you, however, that I will endeavour to obtain for you as much information as possible about the captured aircraft. He trumpeted and hurriedly left the room. We were desperate, as we had lost at least some chance of getting information regarding the captured B-17. As far as army and navy interactions were concerned, the left hand never suspected what the right hand was doing at that moment. Another week passed and we were still sitting on the ground. Even the peaceful atmosphere of Bali gradually began to get on our nerves. Probably under other circumstances we would have enjoyed the enforced inactivity, but we had come here to fight. For several years I had learned only one thing to fight, so now both I and the other pilots were eager to get back in the air. One morning, a panting pilot came rushing into our barracks. He brought some exciting news. Rotation. It was only a rumour for now, but he said that some of us would be sent back to Japan. Everyone immediately started counting their time spent in overseas theatres. I figured that of all those who should be sent home I should be the very first. I left Japan for China in May 1938, and, if you subtract the year of recovery from my wound, I had spent 35 months in overseas theatre. When I realised that I could realistically be home, I immediately became terribly homesick. I spent the entire afternoon rereading letters from Fujiko and my mother. They wrote at great length about the celebrations in Japan on the occasion of the capture of Singapore in February, and about the other festivities which had been held to mark our victories. All Japan rejoiced at the reports of the sensational victories of our armed forces, especially in the air. Soon I would be able to see Fujiko again, the most beautiful girl I had ever met. I had only seen her once, but the thought that perhaps, or even probably, she would become my bride made me happy. Unlike many other rumours, the report of the upcoming rotation turned out to be true. On March 12th, Lieutenant Commander Tadashi Nakajima flew in from Japan and informed the squadron that he was becoming its new commander in place of Lieutenant Izo Shingo. Lieutenant Shingo has been rotated out. I will now read you the names of those pilots ordered to return to Japan. There was dead silence as Nakajima read out the list. My name was not called first as I had hoped. It was not called second or third. I listened without believing my ears, but the commander read out a list of 70 names, and mine was not among them. I was shocked and offended. I could not understand why I had been excluded from the list of pilots returning to Japan. After all, I had spent more time at sea than any of them. A little later I approached the new commander and asked Mr. Lieutenant Captain, I understand that my name is not among those pilots being sent home. Would you be so kind as to tell me why? I don't believe. Lieutenant Commander Nakajima interrupted me with a wave of his hand and a smile. No, you're not going home with the others. I need you, Sakai, and you will fly with me. We will redeploy to a new base, an advanced airfield to face the enemy. We're going to Rabaul on the island of New Britain. As far as I know, you're the best pilot in this squadron.
and you're coming with me. Let the rest of the men go home and defend the homeland. That was the end of it. The conversation had to stop. The discipline that existed in the fleet did not allow me to ask the commander any more questions. I returned to my barracks frustrated, angry at the world, and desperate to see Fujiko and my family. It wasn't until many months later that I learned that Lieutenant Commander Nakajima had actually saved my life by choosing me as his pilot. Those pilots who returned home were later transferred to aircraft carriers bound for Midway, where the Japanese fleet suffered a crushing defeat on June 5th. Almost all of the pilots who left Bali were killed. But the next few weeks became just awful for me. I became frustrated and desperate, and on top of all this came physical ailments. Our next destination was Rabol, 2,500 miles east of Bali. This was too much for the Zero fighter. Instead of moving a group of pilots by transport plane, flying boat, or even a fast-moving warship, we were herded like cattle onto an old, dirty, slow-moving transport. More than 80 people squeezed into an old runabout that barely crawled at 12 knots. We were allotted only one small patrol boat for protection. Never have I felt so defenceless and vulnerable as I did while on that vessel. We couldn't understand what the High Command was thinking. Just one torpedo from a lurking submarine, just one 500-pound bomb from a dive bomber, and this decrepit transport would be blown to a thousand pieces. It was hard to believe, but the fact remained. Command had decided to risk half the fighter pilots in this theatre, including those with vast combat experience, by driving them onto this floating antique. Dissatisfied and gloomy, I was finally down and sick. I lay on my bunk in the hold of the ship for the entire two-week passage from Bali to Rabol. The ship rattled and groaned as it made anti-submarine zigzags. Every time we crossed the keel of a patrolman, the ship lurching and lurching like a drunk. Conditions in the hold were monstrous. The heat was unbearable. All two weeks I lay soaked to the skin, as sweat flowed literally in streams. The hold stank of paint, and literally all the pilots with me were sick. After we passed the island of Timor, already occupied by our troops, the patrolman suddenly turned around and melted away. But now I was seriously ill. At times it seemed to me that I was dying, and I hoped that death would at last relieve me of my terrible sufferings. But even the hardest trials bring some reward. During the whole journey I was accompanied by a young lieutenant who had recently been appointed commander of my unit. LT. Junichi Sasai was one of the most remarkable people I have ever met. He was a graduate of the Naval Academy and was therefore unfamiliar with the problems non-commissioned officers had to deal with. The Navy's caste system was so rigid that even if we were dying in the holds, the lieutenant wasn't required to be there at all, as one might think. But Sasai turned out to be a very different man. He waived the unwritten law that officers were not allowed to make friends among the lower ranks. As I groaned and thrashed about in a fever, drenched in stinking sweat, Sasai sat beside me and tried to ease my suffering as best he could. Every time I opened my eyes I was confronted with his clear and friendly gaze. His friendliness and the help he provided helped me endure the gruelling journey. Finally the transport dropped anchor in the harbour of Rabaul, New Britain's main port. With a sigh of relief, I crawled out of the hold and onto the dock, and then I couldn't believe my eyes. If Bali was an earthly paradise, Rabol seemed to have emerged from the depths of hell. Our air group had to be based on a narrow and dusty airstrip. It was the worst airfield I had ever seen. Very close to this supposed airfield, a volcano cone was rising 700 feet up. Every few minutes the ground would shudder, the volcano would grunt deafeningly, and then spit out a pile of rocks and a cloud of thick, choking smoke. Behind the volcano stood bleak and bare mountain peaks, devoid of even a sign of vegetation. As soon as we left the ship, the pilots were taken to the airfield. The dusty road we rolled down went several inches deep into the layer of volcanic ash covering the ground. The runway was neglected and dirty. Clouds of dust and ash flew up from beneath our feet with every step. The pilots involuntarily let out cries of despair when they saw the fighter planes parked there. Old machines with open cockpits and non-retractable landing gear. It was clawed again. I felt worse again and just collapsed. LT, 
Sasai immediately sent me to a half-built hospital on a hill next to the airfield. But the next morning I learned that Rabol was by no means the place of exile I had first thought it was. Rabol was not on the periphery of the war, but in the very centre of it. While I was still asleep, the air raid alarm suddenly sounded. Through the window I saw a dozen twin-engine marauder bombers flying over the harbour at a very low altitude. They had aptly put several bombs into the transport Komaki Maru, on which we had just arrived from Bali. The crew was unloading the holds when the B-26s appeared, and the sailors scattered all over the dock and even jumped into the water to get away from them. Within seconds, the flaming, mangled transport lay on the bottom, and the bombers, which bore Australian identification marks, then took over the airfield and the planes parked there. For three consecutive days, the marauders returned to bomb the airfield and generally anything that had the indiscretion to move. They flew slowly at low altitude while their gunners amused themselves by firing at anything. Not a single man could stick his nose out, as he immediately drew the fire of several heavy machine guns. These attacks proved to be the best medicine for me. At least in Rabaul I could hope for some labour that would pull me out of the quagmire into which I had sunk after spending several weeks on the ground. I began begging the doctor to discharge me from the hospital immediately. I was already looking forward to clutching the Zero's control stick in my hands. But the doctor only laughed. You'll be here for a few more days, Sakai. There's no point in discharging you now. We simply don't have the fighters. When the planes arrive, I'll release you immediately. Four days later, I felt much better and left the hospital. Along with 19 other pilots, I boarded a four-engine flying boat that arrived that morning. Soon we were in the air again. The fact was that the Kasuga Air Transport had delivered 20 new fighters for our squadron. However, constant enemy raids prevented the Kasuga from reaching Rabol, and instead the transport waited off Buka Island, 200 miles from Rabol. A seaplane was to take us there. And two hours later we were back in Rabol, jubilant as boys. Only instead of toys we received 20 new fighters, fully fueled, armed and ready for battle. However, an enemy reconnaissance plane spotted our fighters standing on the runway that same day and fled before we could take off. Rabol was quiet again, except for the constant grumbling of the volcano. Over the next few weeks, new fighters and bombers streamed into Rabol. Command was building up air power to launch an air offensive against Australia and Port Moresby on New Guinea. We were told that the plan of operation called for the complete occupation of New Guinea. In early April, 30 pilots of the Tainan Air Corp were transferred to the new Ley Air Base on the east coast of New Guinea. Our group was led to the new location by Captain First Rank Masahisa Saito. Thus began one of the most brutal air battles of the entire Pacific War. Being only 180 miles from the main Allied bastion in Port Moresby, we immediately began escorting bombers that came from Rabaul to attack enemy positions in the area. Such raids were made almost daily. However, the war was no longer one-sided. Very often at the very moment we were bombing Port Moresby, Allied fighters and bombers would strike lay. The courage of the Allied pilots impressed us. They willingly took the fight. Each time we met them during the lay attack, several Allied planes were either damaged or did not return to base at all. Our raids on Port Moresby inflicted additional losses on the Allies. It should be especially emphasised that Allied fighter pilots did not hesitate to take the fight. Despite the balance of forces, their fighters immediately rushed to the attack. At the same time, they were well aware that their planes are inferior in their flying characteristics zero. Moreover, almost all of our pilots were hardened veterans. These two factors gave us a tangible advantage, but we were up against a brave opponent. They were hardly inferior to those of our pilots who, three years later, began to go on flights from which there was no return. On April 8th, I flew with eight other pilots from Rabaul to the new base at Ley. As I circled over the airfield, I began to grumble. Where are the hangars? Where are the maintenance shops? Where is the flight control tower? Where's the airfield? Just a small, dirty runway. I felt like I was landing on the deck of an aircraft carrier. The runway was surrounded on three sides by the jagged mountain ranges of Papua, and on the fourth side, where I was coming in for landing, it was bounded by the ocean. The 21 pilots had flown here a few days ago,
and now they were meeting us at the end of the runway as we taxied to the aircraft parking areas. Honda and Yonakawa, my wingmen during the battles for Java, were the first to greet me. Welcome, Sakai, shouted Honda, smiling broadly. The most wonderful place in the world welcomes you. I looked at Honda. He was joking around as usual, though I saw no reason to be cheerful in this damn hole. The airstrip was no more than 3,000 feet long and ran perpendicular to the mountainside almost to the water. Next to the beach was a small hangar, riddled with shrapnel and bullet holes. The rusted wreckage of three Australian transport planes lay in the grass, and wrecked equipment was visible everywhere. Our planes had bombed and strafed the hangar more than once during the landing last month. The Ley airfield was used by the Australians to deliver supplies and export gold ore from the Kokoda mines, located far away in the Owen Stanley Mountains. It was almost impossible to reach the mines by land as thick, wet jungle and steep mountain slopes got in the way. The small harbour was as abandoned as an airfield. A small ship of about 500 tonnes displacement, also Australian, lay on the bottom, deeply buried in silt. Its stern and mast were sticking out of the water next to a small pier. It was the only ship in the vicinity. I was convinced that Ley was the worst airfield I had ever seen, not excluding Rabol, and even the forward airfields in China. Nothing, however, could worsen Honda's mood. I tell you, Saburo, he insisted, that you have arrived at the finest hunting grounds on earth. Don't let the airfield or the jungle fool you. We've never had such a convenient opportunity to recharge. At that, he continued to smile. Honda was being completely serious. He really liked it here. He explained that pilots from this godforsaken base had been fighting air battles for two days straight before we arrived. On April 5th, four Zeros from Ley escorted seven bombers attacking Port Moresby and shot down two enemy fighters, losing one of their own. The next day, four fighters were again on the flight. The triumphant pilots reported that they had shot down five enemy planes. Yesterday, April 7th, two Zeros intercepted three enemy bombers at Salamaua and shot down two during the chase. The third was probably shot down, but the enemy gunners took one Zero with them. For Honda, combat was the most important thing in his life. He didn't care that he had to fly from a shithole. He didn't care about that. In the afternoon, we gathered at the airfield near the command post for a briefing. I use the words command post in a figurative sense because it didn't exist. This command post could have been called a hut if it had walls. There was a small awning from which mats hung which served as both walls and doors. The room was not very large, and when all thirty pilots were gathered there was hardly enough room. In the middle of the hut stood a rough table, hastily made of boards. The command post was illuminated by a few candles and one kerosene lamp. The telephones ran on batteries. After Captain First Rank Saito had briefed us, we went to the barracks. Near the command post I saw all the vehicles available in Ley. The first was an ancient, rusty, creaking Ford, the second was a dilapidated truck, and the third was a tanker truck. They serviced the entire base. There were no hangars on the airfield. We didn't even have a flight control tower. However, to my great disappointment, Ley failed to cool Honda and Yonikawa's ardor. Honda picked up my duffel bag and hummed merrily as we walked toward the barracks. Along the way, Yonikawa showed me the local sights. There were 200 sailors manning the anti-aircraft guns set up around the airfield. They made up the entire Ley garrison. These 200 men, 100 airplane mechanics and 30 pilots made up all the Japanese troops stationed at Ley. During the entire time we were there, and until the Allies captured Ley in 1943, no attempt was made to set up the base. Likewise, no troops were moved there. Twenty non-commissioned officers and three enlisted airmen crammed into one hut. This so-called building was six by ten yards in size. In the centre stood a table which we alternately used for eating, writing and reading. On the walls close together were camp beds. A few candles made up all the lighting. This barracks was a typical native hut, the floor of which was raised five feet above the ground. It had to be climbed up a rickety ladder. Behind the barracks was a large water cistern. The soldiers cut the bottom off a fuel barrel 
and turned it into a makeshift bathtub. There was an unwritten rule that all airmen had to take a bath every night. A few more cut-up fuel barrels were used in the kitchen and for laundry. There was a messenger assigned to the kitchen. He was a very busy man, as it was not at all easy to feed 65 men during the day. However, despite the intense fighting that lasted for the next few weeks, each airman found time to wash his laundry daily. We could live in a mud hole, but no man was willing to be overgrown with filth. Not far from the barrels dug into the ground, soldiers dug primitive slits that served as bomb shelters. When enemy bombers appeared, they flew over the trees to take us by surprise. But the shelters filled in record time with people hastily jumping out of huts, barrel baths and toilets. We lived 500 yards east of the airfield and had to walk to the plains. Such a luxury as transportation by automobile only came along when the order came for an emergency takeoff. Then a Ford would pick us up. About 500 yards northeast of the strip was the officers' barracks. Their hut was exactly the same as ours. The only advantage the officers had was that there were only 10 men living in the hut. They enjoyed all the same facilities, but there were half as many of them. The base commander, his deputy and assistant lived in a tiny hut next to the officer's hut. For four months, every day for four months we performed practically the same tasks, which quickly became a boring routine. At 0230 the mechanics and technicians would rise and start preparing our fighters. An hour later the ordinaries would wake the pilots. We had breakfast usually in the hut, and only sometimes in the air near the command post. Our menu was monotonous and unchanging. A bowl of rice, soybean paste soup, with dried vegetables and pickles made up breakfast. In the first month, rice was mixed with completely inedible barley to conserve supplies. However, after four weeks of continuous fighting we were no longer served barley. But in any case our rations at Ley were totally inadequate. After breakfast, six pilots would go to the planes, warm up the engines and prepare them for takeoff. They were supposed to be interceptors. They stood at the end of the runway ready for immediate takeoff. At Ley we had never conducted reconnaissance flights, and we didn't even know radar existed. But six fighter planes could be in the air in a matter of seconds. Those pilots who did not participate in the scheduled sorties waited around the command centre. Since there was nothing to discuss but air battles, to pass the time, we played chess and checkers. At 8am, the Zero Group would take to the air for patrols. Going hunting, they flew to enemy positions by the shortest route along the Moresby Valley. If an assignment came to escort bombers, we flew southeast along the Papua coast and rendezvoused with the bombers somewhere near Buna. At noon, we usually returned to Ley for lunch, but it was not a meal worth coming back for. The food was the same, and on top of that the same food we got for dinner. Lunch consisted of a cup of boiled rice and a portion of canned fish or meat. The officers fared little better. Their rations were exactly the same, but the five ordinaries tried hard that the officers' meals at least looked different. In between the three official meals, the pilots snacked on fruit, drank juice, and sucked on candy to somehow compensate for the lack of vitamins and calories in the rations. At about 5pm, all pilots would gather for their daily calisthenics. Physical exercise was required to keep our bodies strong and agile and our reactions quick. After the group exercises, all pilots who were not supposed to be on airfield duty would disperse to their barracks to eat dinner and wash up. They still had two to three hours to read and write letters home. By 8 or 9 p.m., we were already in our bunks. All entertainment was of an impromptu nature. The pilots often played guitars, ukuleles, accordions, harmonicas, got together to sing Japanese songs. While the base at Rabol had a sufficient number of natives who were used for various jobs, we in Ley had to make do with our own labour everywhere and everywhere. The nearest village was two miles away, and we could not persuade or force the natives to stay at the airfield, which was subjected almost daily to enemy air raids. They were frightened by the roar of airplanes, the crack of machine guns, and the bursting of bombs. Such was life in Ley. Disgusting food and hard daily work became routine. No mail was delivered, and there was nowhere to rest. Women? In Ley, literally everyone asked, what's that all about? However, our morale remained high. 
Our daily lives definitely lacked amenities, even the most basic ones, but that didn't upset anyone. We were not here to have fun, but to fight. We wanted to fight. After all, what are fighter pilots for if not to destroy enemy planes in combat? In Bali, which can reasonably be called an earthly paradise, people were always grumbling. There we sat on the ground, and the bound wings of our eagles were the heaviest punishment for us. It should be recalled that the personnel of the fighter detachment in Ley was not like the pilots of other airbases. Each of us went through a careful selection. In Ley, our officers gathered those who were eager for only one thing to press the gun when the Zero lined up in the tail of the enemy aircraft. On April 11th, I was in combat again. The return was very successful, as it was the first time I was able to make a doublet in one day. The prospect of going into combat again after two months of enforced idleness seriously worried me. Even the day before, April 10th, I was not supposed to be sent on a flight. I was to remain on the ground when the other pilots were enjoying their daily skirmishes. Six of our fighters escorted seven bombers to Port Moresby and shot down two enemy bombers trying to sneak off the airfield. Another was probably shot down. Later that day, three on-duty Zeros took off from Ley Airfield and managed to intercept several enemy bombers over Salamawa. Our sortie on April 11th was more of a familiarisation flight. Together with eight other pilots who had just arrived at Ley, we took off, formed three wedges and flew to Port Moresby. As we flew along the coast, we gradually gained altitude. The weather was perfect, the white sandy beaches glistened in the sun. Then the Owen Stanley Range appeared in front of us rising 15,000 feet above the ocean. Despite the high altitude, snow did not cover the tops of the peaks, and the same terrible jungle stood wall to wall on their slopes. At 16,500 feet we crossed the ridge. Immediately we found ourselves in a completely different world. An enemy world. I was unable to see a single ship in the vast, dark blue expanse of the Coral Sea. The water was an incredible deep blue colour and stretched in every direction as far as the eye could reach. The mountainside below us dipped to the south, but more gently than near our airfield. Otherwise it was exactly the same. About 45 minutes after takeoff, the buildings of the Port Moresby airbase began to glimmer under my wings. On the ground I could see a large number of airplanes of various types. Many of them were taxiing from the airfield to parking lots in the jungle where they would be sheltered from air raids by dense foliage, for the enemy airfield was surrounded by veritable thickets. The anti-aircraft guns were silent. Probably we were too far away. The situation seemed favourable for shelling the airfield. We could shoot the planes on the ground before the enemy had time to hide them in hiding places, but the order was clear familiarisation flight in extreme case of air combat and no shelling. We flew over Port Moresby and turned toward the Coral Sea. After a while we reversed course and again flew over the enemy base. Here we were surprised to find that the enemy pilots and anti-aircraft gunners were still completely ignoring us. We flew over the airfield. Now the sun was right behind us. Following at cruising speed, we finally spotted the enemy planes. They were four P-39 fighters, the first Aerocobras I had met. They were flying almost directly at us three miles away and slightly to our left. It was impossible to tell if they had spotted us or not. I dropped my outboard tank and gave full throttle my two wingmen followed me. I levelled with the lead fighter and gestured to LT, Sasai to report the sighted planes, asking him to cover our attack. Sasai waved his hand forward, indicating attack. We'll cover you. The Aerocobras did not react in any way. We were lucky. Since the blinding sun was beating directly into the eyes of the American pilots, they failed to notice our approaching fighters. The P-39s were flying in two pairs, the first 300 yards ahead of the second. I put the Honda just behind and above me, and ordered the less experienced Yonikawa to follow exactly behind my fighter. At this time we were only 500 yards away from the enemy fighters, dovetailing to the left. In a few seconds we were ready to attack. If the Americans were still blinded by the sun, we could shoot them down before they became aware of our presence. But the moment I was ready to rush in, I decided to strike in a different way. If I attacked them from a dive, I would lose the advantage of the sun behind me. Instead, 
I immediately pushed the handle forward and threw the fighter into a dive. Under and Yonakawa stayed behind me like glued. We descended, turned abruptly, and found ourselves in just the perfect position. The trailing American fighters were now just above and ahead of me, unaware of our approach. The sun was still blinding them, and I was quickly closing the distance, waiting until the target was simply impossible to miss. Two P-39s flew almost wing to wing, and at fifty yards they filled the rings of the scope. There. I squeezed the gun's throttle, and in a couple of seconds the first Aero Cobra was finished. The shells hit the centre of the fuselage. Pieces of metal flew. A jet of flame burst out of the plane, smoke billowed. I slid onto the wing and took aim at the second Aero Cobra. Again the shells hit the target, exploding inside the fuselage. Both Aerocobras lost control at once. I levelled the fighter and immediately made a steep turn, preparing to tail the two leading fighters. But the fight was already over. Both P-39s, tumbling, flew to the ground, burning brightly and dragging tails of smoke behind them. They were shot down as quickly as the pair I had caught sight of. I saw one Zero coming out of the dive. It was flown by Hiroyoshi Nishizawa. The second Zero, which had succeeded, was piloted by Toshio Ota. He was already candling upward to join the group. It was hard to believe, but the whole fight lasted no more than five seconds, and four enemy fighters were already burning on the ground below. It was especially gratifying that the victories were won by young pilots. Nishizawa was 23 years old, and Ota was only 22. A small clarification is necessary here. As stated earlier, all the pilots in Lei were specially selected. The most important criterion was their flying ability. But these two young pilots stood out even among those who flew with me. Many of us were battle-hardened veterans, so the rookies learned very quickly. Nishizawa and Ota proved themselves to be brilliant pilots. Later they both became, like me, the best aces of the Pacific War. Very often we flew together, and the other pilots called us the three cleaners. Nishizawa and Ota, from my point of view, well deserved to be called piloting geniuses. They didn't pilot their fighters, they just became part of their zero. The pilots literally merged every cell with the fighter, and from the outside it began to seem like the airplane was behaving like a sentient being. They were some of the greatest Japanese pilots. Both pilots saw themselves only as fighter pilots. Everything was subordinated to one task to improve their fighting skills. Their skill made them formidable opponents. Even against a fighter that outclassed the Zero the kind we encountered constantly at the end of the war, their valour allowed them to attack several enemy planes and emerge victorious from the battle. Hiroyoshi Nishizawa became Japan's greatest ace. However, he did not appear to be one at all. At the first look at Nishizawa, anyone involuntarily began to pity him. This man belonged in a hospital bed. He was tall for a Japanese, almost 173 cm tall, but he weighed only 64 kg, and it seemed that the bones were about to pierce the skin. Nishizawa was almost constantly sick with malaria and suffered from tropical ulcers. His face was always pale. Despite the sincere admiration of the other pilots, Nishizawa honoured few with his friendship. He withdrew into himself, and this shell of icy unfriendliness was almost impossible to break through. Very often Nishizawa did not utter a single word all day long. He might well have failed to respond to appeals from his closest friends, the men with whom he had flown and fought. We were accustomed to his constantly strolling alone, apart from his friends, silent and sad, though this was quite unusual for a man universally admired. If I may say so, Nishizawa was only a pilot he lived and breathed to fly, and he flew for two things. The first was the joy he felt in that strange and wonderful world, the skies, and the second was combat. As soon as his plane took to the air, this strange and phlegmatic man immediately changed unrecognisably. His concentration, his silence, his aloofness disappeared as quickly as darkness disappears at dawn. To all who flew with him, he became the devil. In the air, he became unpredictable, like any genius. His fighter responded obediently to every barely perceptible touch on the control stick. I had never seen anyone do with his fighter what Nishizawa did with his zero.
his flying was literally breathtaking. Brilliant and unpredictable execution of figures made the heart sink. He was a bird, but he flew in a way that no bird could even dream of. Nishizawa had unusually sharp eyesight. Where we all saw only Sky Nishizawa with his superhuman eyesight could distinguish tiny dots of enemy planes. He fully justified his nickname the Devil, but he became a devil only in the midst of azure and clouds. This man was so gifted that all of us, even myself, recognized him as a flying genius. Toshio Ota was his direct opposite. A handsome youngster, Ota was friendly and outgoing. He was always ready to join in the fun, some common amusement, laughing happily at jokes. Ota instinctively sensed which of the pilots needed help, both in the sky and on the ground. He was taller and denser than me, but like Nishizawa, had no combat experience before arriving in Lei. Although Ota looked nothing like Nishizawa, his flying skills were also quickly recognized by all. Ota always flew as the wingman of the squadron commander, covering for him. Ota was in no way a model hero. He easily changed moods, then falling into sadness, then cheerful, very quickly get along with people. The aura of a hero did not match his smiling, boyish face. Such a guy was more likely to be found at home, somewhere in a nightclub, not at the godforsaken Lay Airfield. But his friendly relations with many pilots did not diminish the respect his flying skills inspired. Even a man as stern as Honda held him in high esteem, though Honda, like Yonikawa, feared the devil and shunned him. The Allies began to drive reinforcements and equipment into Port Moresby in an ever-increasing stream. Our high command therefore demanded that we launch more frequent and stronger attacks against airfields, ground installations, and the port. On April 17th, I flew out for the first time to escort bombers to attack enemy installations. The bombers were covered by 13 zeros, not six or seven as usual. Our scouts reported that stronger Allied fighter opposition was expected than before. I was worried about my pilots. Naval aviator first class Yoshio Miyazaki looked completely exhausted after a prolonged bout of diarrhea, and I didn't think he was ready to fly. But despite my objections, Miyazaki refused to stay on the ground. At first I seriously feared that the fever would prevent him from keeping in formation during the flight, but as we approached Port Moresby, my fears faded. Miyazaki held steady with my group of six fighters covering the bombers from above and the other seven zeros. The bombers flew at 1,600 feet, and we flew 1,500 feet higher. It was in this formation that we crossed the Owen Stanley Ridge. Port Moresby soon came into view. The seven zeros, keeping close to the bombers, stopped snaking and went steeply upward, still keeping in a tight group. Soon we spotted P-40 fighters dive bombing from high altitude to attack the bombers. At the sight of the Zeros coming up to meet them, the enemy fighters mixed up the formation and floundered in different directions. Seven of our fighters returned to the same place. Flashes of flame and puffs of smoke appeared under our bombers, but anti-aircraft shells were bursting 1,500 feet below. These bursts, however, were an ominous sign. We immediately broke formation and began manoeuvring desperately to dodge the shells. It was very timely. The enemy had put a second barrage of fire dangerously close to us, but still not close enough to damage the planes. Already when we took our place in formation again, the bombers and their immediate escort began to gain altitude, squeezing all the power out of their engines. We knew that the third salvo of anti-aircraft guns will have to be in the very center of the line of bombers if they continue to fly the same course and so it happened. Shells with a crack began to burst where our planes should have been. For unknown reasons, the Americans did not react in any way to our change in speed and altitude, almost every time they fired with their sights set unchanged. They did this with such stubbornness that we had no difficulty in evading their fire. The bombers passed over Port Moresby and began to smoothly describe a wide arc to lie on a fighting course. This was done so that the sun would be behind them and would not blind the pilots and bombers. But barely the bombers took a course to the target, as from the height of six fighters came down on us. I jerked the handle toward me, putting my zero on the pop. The other five fighters obediently roared after me as we turned directly toward the enemy attack. But we didn't get a chance to open fire.
The enemy fighters turned away and scattered in different directions as they continued to dive. We returned to our position, but only two fighters took their places beside me. Miyazaki and two other pilots probably just went nuts. They turned down and ended up under the bombers. But I didn't have time to worry about Miyazaki. The enemy anti-aircraft gunners never gave up trying to take aim, and 1,500 feet below the bombers, the tangle of bursts appeared again. Now they could no longer dodge because they were lying on a fighting course and the bombers were catching their targets in their crosshairs. I pedalled on and turned away from where the next salvo was to explode. Then the bombers disappeared, hidden from view by the huge cloud of smoke that had appeared at the site of a whole series of bursts. And then it looked like a real miracle all seven planes emerged from the billowing smoke. Their bomb hatches were open and the black dots of bombs were already flying down. I watched them make a graceful curve as they gained speed. As they exploded, the bombs threw out a fountain of smoke with a bright flash in the centre. Emptying themselves, the bombers began to increase speed to jump out of the solid wall of bursts and then turned steeply to the left. Miyazaki was still below them and it was a very dangerous place to be. But without a radio, I couldn't get him back to his proper position and we just didn't dare leave the bombers without cover. We passed Port Moresby and left behind the bursts of anti-aircraft guns. I breathed a sigh of relief. Too soon, almost a mile above us a single P-40 appeared and immediately began dive bombing at an incredible speed. It was coming down so fast that I didn't even have time to move a finger. Here was an American fighter above us, and the next second he, like lightning, rushed at the bombers. The fighter flashed 600 yards ahead of me, and I suddenly realised that he intended to go for a ram. How the American jumped between the third and fourth bombers of the left wing, I never realised. It was simply impossible, but it happened. Firing from all machine guns, the P-40 cut through the line of bombers and dropped a jet of red-hot lead on Miyazaki's plane. The Zero immediately burst into flames. At breakneck speed, the P-40 disappeared somewhere below. Miyazaki's plane began a smooth descent, and flaming like a torch. And then there was a blinding flash that shattered the Zero into tiny pieces. We couldn't see a single piece of wreckage. The whole episode lasted three or four seconds. We continued to fly home. Over Buna, our fighters separated from the bombers and headed for Lei. Miyazaki's death was a heavy loss for all of us. I was firmly convinced that at the beginning of the war, the individual skill of our pilots was superior to that of the Dutch, Australians and Americans. Our training before the war was more thorough than that of any other country. To us flying meant everything. We devoted all our energies to learning the various aspects of air combat, and of course we flew fighter aircraft that were far superior to the enemies. But in the air battles of World War II, individual skill did not guarantee survival at all. Of course, there were many occasions when we met the enemy in one-on-one -on -one aerial duels, and then the class of the pilot brought victory. But such duels were the exception, not the rule. Our greatest weakness in aerial combat was that we did not know how to work together, and that was a quality the Americans had practiced extensively during the war. The death of Miyazaki, as well as the deaths of three other pilots shot down in early April, I am inclined to explain the inability of our pilots to act as a single, cohesive team. When encountering enemy fighters, our pilots tended to fly off in different directions to have free reign, trying to get into individual duels as they did in WW Dai. Japanese pilots, even in the late 30s, considered the most important quality of a fighter plane to be its ability to fit inside an enemy turn. Maneuverability was placed above all other characteristics. For some time this tactic was still in effect, but the value of the ability to fight individually was reduced to zero when the enemy refused to fight according to our rules, or when stubborn adherence to a predetermined plan reduced the effectiveness of single attacks. Two days after Miyazaki's death, seven B-26 bombers attacked Lei. Fortunately we had received advance word of their approach, and nine fighters took to the air to meet the enemy, who was coming in at an altitude of only 1,500 feet. For an hour we chased the marauders, shelling them. Eventually it became clear that we had only managed to shoot down one bomber. The others suffered various damages but managed to escape. It was one of the most ridiculous fights I have ever seen.
The Nine Zeros did not establish any kind of synergy. Instead of attacking one or two bombers as a group and blowing the B-26s to pieces with concentrated fire, our pilots were running around like scolded men trying to act on their own. Several times fighters had to turn away in a hurry, stopping firing to avoid collision with another Zero or to avoid being shot at by their own comrade. It was a miracle we didn't ram or shoot each other. By the time we landed at Ley, I was just seething with anger. I jumped out of the cockpit of the Zero, shoved my mechanics aside, and ordered the hapless pilots to line up. For fifteen minutes I scolded their stupidity, pointing out their mistakes, and emphasised that it was only by sheer luck that we all made it back to Ley alive today. From that day on we held meetings every night, discussing how to improve our interactions. These meetings continued during a strange and totally unexpected pause in the air battles. On April 23rd, Nishizawa, Ota and I went on a reconnaissance flight to Karuk, a new enemy base just north of Port Moresby. We shelled and burned several carrier aircraft detected at the airfield. We were only ordered to reconnoitre, but the temptation was too great. Especially after our abysmal performance in air combat, Upon our return, orders were received to send 15 planes there the next day to bombard the airfield. We found six B-26 bombers, 15 P-40 fighters, and one P-39 that appeared to be intending to leave the base. We destroyed two bombers and six P-40s. The P-39 was probably destroyed. After this one-sided battle was over, we flew on to Port Moresby and burned a PBY flying boat anchored there. My desire for concerted action was probably overdone, especially because we were flying in such a large group. However, I ended the day without shooting down a single aircraft. Nor did Nishizawa shoot down a single airplane, much to his great disappointment. The next day we returned to Port Moresby. Despite heavy losses the previous day, the enemy put up strong resistance to us. Seven P-40s ventured into combat with our fifteen fighters. Six enemy planes crashed to the ground, engulfed in flames. We suffered no losses, and when the sky was cleared, we shelled the airfields of Port Moresby and Kairuku, destroying five B-26s and two P-40s. Obviously, our new attempt at coherence was effective. That said, it had not benefited me and Nishizawa personally. Already two battles in a row, in which other pilots increased their score, we had failed to shoot down a single airplane. We argued until deep into the night, analysing our actions in the battle. We tried to figure out what we were doing wrong. Everything seemed right, but the cold facts said otherwise. Not one of our bullets hit the target. The next air battle took place on April 26th. Again I came back without shooting anyone down. Again Nishizawa did not shoot down a single airplane, although other pilots destroyed three P-40s. Nishizawa was puzzled. He waved off the remote sight and clambered into one P-40, whose pilot was desperately trying to get rid of his pursuer. Nishizawa came close to the American fighter and opened fire on it with cannons and machine guns. Still, the American slipped away. April 29th was Emperor Hirohito's birthday, and our commander decided to organise a small celebration in honour of this event. All the men who had any experience as cooks were sent to the kitchen and prepared the best breakfast our meagre resources allowed. The Allies had not even attempted to bomb Ley in the previous days. This respite and the relaxed atmosphere of the holiday should have made us let our guard down a bit. At least that's what the Allies were clearly hoping for. At zero seven, double zero, we were barely finishing breakfast when the observers shouted, enemy planes and immediately the morning silence was broken by a nasty unsteady clanking. We used buckets, jerry cans and small basins for signalling. In the general cacophony were intertwined the sounds of two horns. That's how our warning system worked. We rushed to the runway, but we were too late. Bombs started exploding all around us. We looked up and saw our old buddies B-17 heavy bombers. Three planes were circling at 20,000 feet. They only dropped a few bombs, but given the high altitude, the bombing accuracy was amazing. Five zeros were reduced to flaming wreckage. Another four fighters were severely damaged, riddled with bomb fragments. Of the six fighters prepared for takeoff, only two survived. Ota and another pilot were the first to reach them. Within seconds they started their engines and raced down the runway. By the time we all got to our planes it was too late to take off.
three B-17s and two Zeros were out of sight. Given the great speed of the B-17s, it was useless to try to catch up with them. Time dragged agonizingly slow. We cursed the bombers and waited for Ota to return. After about an hour, a single Zero went in for a landing. It was Endo's. We attacked them while they were gaining altitude and tried to make it work as best we could. Ota had damaged one bomber and was still firing at it when I ran out of ammunition. So I flew home. Another hour passed, but Ota still hadn't returned. We were already starting to worry. Ota was a friend to almost every one of us. A brilliant pilot, he dared to single-handedly attack two heavily armed B-17s. Endo was nearly tearing his hair out and calling himself a fool for risking leaving Ota alone. After another 15 minutes had passed, Captain First Rank Sato poked his head out of the command center and shouted cheerfully to us, Hey, he's all right. Ota just radioed in from Salamaua. He definitely shot down one B-17, but went down because he ran out of fuel. He'll be back soon. Wonderful news. However, we still had unfinished business. Six pilots, including Nishizawa and myself, had been selected to return the Emperor's birthday greetings to Port Moresby. We would have felt more confident if we had 16 Zeros. However, our six Zeros remained the only serviceable aircraft. The enemy must have been expecting retaliation for his daring attack on Ley. Anticipating a barrage of fire from waiting anti-aircraft guns, we crossed the ridge at 16,000 feet. But instead of flying toward Port Moresby at high altitude, we dived as soon as we passed the mountains. Then we gained altitude sharply and dived straight for the enemy base. It worked perfectly. All the enemy's calculations went to hell. No one expected such tactics from us. In a wide arc, we passed over the airfield, keeping above the ground. Dozens of mechanics and technicians crowded around the bombers and fighters, preparing them for takeoff. This meant that the planes were fully fueled and armed just the perfect situation for a surprise bombardment. It was impossible to miss such targets, and we generously poured bullets and shells onto the runway. I saw the people on the ground staring at us in amazement, hardly believing their own eyes. Six Soros that appeared out of nowhere. We made our first run without interference. Not a single gun fired on us. After sweeping the runway along its entire length, we turned around abruptly and went straight to the second approach. A nice picture was unfolding before us. Three fighters and a bomber were blazing brightly. This time we shelled another row of airplanes. Long lines of cannon and machine gun fire rained down on the enemy planes. We damaged four bombers and fighters, although this time none of them caught fire. When we began the second approach, people ran in different directions, although several dozen remained on the ground, hit by our bullets. We made a total of three runs, after which we sped away at high speed. It was only when we were flying away from the airfield that the anti-aircraft guns started talking for the first time. I only grinned. Let them waste their ammunition. But at 0530 the next day, the enemy repaid us. Three marauder crept up at minimum altitude, keeping no higher than 600 feet. The ground shuddered and shook as the B-26s put their bombs right on our runway. As the smoke cleared, we saw five of our duty fighters begin to scatter, but barely had they gotten off the ground as the enemy planes came back and attacked again. They dropped their bombs before the Zeros had time to gain altitude and attack them. And then the enemy disappeared, vanishing into the pre-dawn haze. They did well. One or zero burned brightly, the other turned into a pile of junk. Four more fighters and a bomber were riddled with bullets and shrapnel. In the next few days, the tension of air battles rapidly increased. Another bombardment of our airfield the Allies conducted perfectly, using 12 P-39 fighters. They severely damaged nine bombers and three fighters. We intercepted the Aerocobras during the withdrawal and shot down two planes without losing a single one. Again, neither I nor Nishizawa were successful. I managed to get even the next day after the P-39 raid, Nine of our fighters flew to Port Moresby, looking for the enemy. And we found him. Nine enemy fighters, P-39s and P-40s, were waiting for us over their airfield. They wanted to fight. As soon as we noticed the enemy planes, they stopped circling and rushed straight at us. I chose the lead fighter.
The P-40 made a turn, hoping to put a line into the belly of my Zero. But I got inside his turn and opened fire myself. The enemy pilot turned back, but he was too late. One more turn and the P-40 was a ball of fire. But this pilot had friends, and as I was coming out of the turn, the P-39 swooped down on me. I didn't even have to chase him. I just did a snake, and the enemy pilot was trapped. The belly of his plane flashed across my scope as he tried to move away. It didn't take me more than a second. I hit the throttles, and the shells tore through the fuselage of the enemy plane. It just disintegrated in mid-air. I was sure he had a wingman, so still firing, I took the stick and pushed the pedal all the way in, throwing the zero into the steepest turn I could make. It helped. I instantly dodged a long line of fire. The surprised pilot tried to dive out of the fight, but it was too late. I managed to finish the turn, caught him in my sights and gave him a turn. The enemy fighter just bumped into my shells, jerked and tumbled down. I screamed with joy. The curse was broken. Three fighters in less than 30 seconds. My first hat trick. The fight was over. My success was my only success. The six surviving enemy fighters took off in a protracted dive, so our fighters just couldn't catch up with them, although Nishizora and the other seven pilots tried to do so. But it was pointless. The American P-39s and P-40s could always get away from the Zeros by diving. When we landed at Ley, my mechanics came running to me in terrible excitement. They were surprised to find out that I had used up a total of 610 rounds of ammunition during the battle, expending 200 rounds for each fighter shot down. Nishizawa came out of the cockpit literally black with anger and frustration. The next day, May 2nd, eight Zeros flew again to Port Moresby. Thirteen enemy fighters were already waiting for us, circling slowly at 18,000 feet. Nishizawa was the first to spot them and immediately rushed to attack. We followed him as he began a steep turn, trying to engage the enemy formation from the left and behind. What happened to those pilots? Are they not even watching what's going on around them? We attacked the enemy group before they knew we were there. Before the enemy pilots realised it was time to dodge, several fighters burst into flames and flew down. Our score that day was eight P-39s and P-40s, of which I accounted for two. Nishizawa jumped out of the cockpit of his Zero, barely coming to a stop. We were surprised, as he usually climbed out very slowly. He happily stretched, raised both arms above his head, and yelled yi ya. We couldn't understand anything. All of this was completely different from Nishizawa's usual behaviour. Then he grinned and walked away. His smiling mechanic explained what was going on. He stood next to the fighter jet and showed us three fingers. Nishizawa was back in fighting form. On May 7th, after a few days of rest in Rabaul, I went on a flight that could be called a perfect hunt. Four Zeros were ordered to reconnoitre Port Moresby, and the pilots, when they saw who would be their wingmen, squealed with joy. We were the best aces in the regiment. I had 22 airplanes, Nishizawa had 13, Ota had 11, and Takatsuka was a little behind with his nine victories. Our best aces. It was the right time to take on the enemy. We knew that in case of danger, each of us would have our comrades back, and surely the enemy pilots have no idea who's about to fly into their hornet's nest. We hoped we'd meet resistance today. And we did. As we circled over Port Moresby, Nishizawa suddenly shook his wings and pointed to ten fighters that were flying in a long column from the sea, keeping 2,000 feet above our group. Nishizawa and Ota formed a wedge of two airplanes, while Takatsuka and I stayed behind and just below. Four P-40s separated from the enemy formation and flew toward us. All four Zeros raised their noses and went up almost vertically, instead of turning away and flying in different directions as the enemy pilots expected. The first P-40 made a tight loop, trying to escape the trap. Its belly flashed in front of me, and I fired. The shells hit the target and cut off the wing. I continued the climb and executed an Immelman, then saw each Zero also shoot its P-40. All of them exploded. The remaining six fighters rushed at us. We spread out left and right, and then did a tight loop, ending up above the enemy. It worked. 
three more P-40s exploded and burned up. After that, three enemy fighters immediately lowered their noses and dive-bombed away from us. On May 8th and 9, during raids to Port Moresby, I destroyed two more enemy fighters, a P-39 and a P-40. On May 10th, I shot down a P-39 using record low ammunition, only four cannon shells. It was the best shooting of my life and the least amount of ammunition expended on an enemy airplane. I was flying over the Coral Sea with Honda and Yonikawa as wingmen. After 15 minutes of patrolling, we spotted a single Aero Cobra flying slowly at 3,000 feet above our fighters. The pilot didn't seem to see anyone or anything. He continued to fly in a straight line as we began to creep up from below from behind. I only started gaining altitude when I was directly under the belly of the enemy plane. There was no way the pilot could see me there, and I could only evade by performing some random maneuver. Honda and Yonikawa flew 200 yards below me, covering. Incredibly, however, the P-39 allowed me to calmly approach. The pilot didn't even realize I existed. I continued my approach until I was less than 20 yards below the enemy fighter, and he still didn't see me. The opportunity was too good to pass up. I took a few pictures with my lacquer camera. The speedometer hand was oscillating at 130 knots, and I memorized that number as the P-39's cruising speed. The amazing joint flight of my Zero and the carefree P-39 continued. Honda and Yonikawa were ready to intercept the Aero Cobra if its pilot spotted me and tried to dive. I continued to climb slowly until I was just to the right of the enemy plane. I could see the enemy pilot quite clearly and had no way of knowing why he was not surveying the sky. He was a large man wearing a white cap. I watched him carefully for a few seconds and then went right under his fighter. I took careful aim and then touched the throttle a little. There was a loud sneeze and two shells came out of each gun. I saw two explosions at the base of the right wing of the P-39 and two more in the centre of the fuselage. The P-39 had broken in half. The two halves of the fuselage first flew apart and then broke into small pieces. The pilot was unable to jump out. The few weeks I spent in Ley taught me to respect the luxury of sleep. During the day we were either in flight or on duty at the airfield in readiness. And at night we wanted only one thing sleep. However, the enemy looked at all this quite differently. And with the onset of darkness invariably appeared his bombers, which dropped a series of bombs on the airfield and showered the ground with multicoloured streams of tracer bullets as they flew over us at low altitude. We could eat whatever we wanted, live in huts, fly from the crappiest airfield, but we couldn't do without sleep. So the Americans and Australians did everything they could to prevent us from sleeping at night. The enemy became so intrusive that we often had to leave our barracks at night. The pilots would go to the runway after dark and go to sleep in the funnels. The well-known theory that a shell never hits the same place twice was reinforced by a passionate desire to sleep. I did not think about what the theory of probability says, but I remembered that during the night raids of enemy planes in Lay six of our pilots were killed. Constant air raids, daily sorties, terrible living conditions exhausted people. They became irritable. Nevertheless, the exemplary behaviour of our officers helped to avoid serious quarrels between pilots. I consider this a special achievement of our isolated garrison. The airbase commander, Captain First Rank Masihisa Sai II, was a true samurai who was surrounded by an aura of calm and dignity. This was in stark contrast to the arrogant and feisty army officers surrounding General Tojo in Tokyo. Calm but commanding, Saiti was constantly concerned for his subordinates. He was careful to make sure everyone took shelter when enemy bombers attacked Lei. Although at times some of us would loiter, we always saw Captain First Rank Saito waiting, even though bombs might already be tearing around for the last pilot to dive into a gap. He himself would walk leisurely from his room or command post to the trenches, looking up into the sky and scrutinising the airfield for stragglers. Only then would he himself descend to the shelter. Needless to say, such actions caused involuntary respect of subordinates. It seems incredible, but this brave officer finished the war without receiving a single wound. But my most memorable experience during my military service was meeting Lieutenant Zunichi Sasai, my immediate commander. He commanded probably the strongest Japanese fighter squadron.
Under Sasai's command served four of Japan's best aces Nishizara, Ota, Takatsuka and myself. It would not be an exaggeration to say that any man who flew with Sasai would have given his life without the slightest hesitation if it was necessary to protect the young lieutenant. I have already told you how his personal assistance helped me to endure the gruelling journey from Bali to Rabol. At the time I wondered more than once if I was seeing things. Or is it a hallucination? After all, it is inconceivable, unthinkable that a squadron commander would stoop to acting as a nurse to a sick pilot. However, Sasai did just that. He was 27 years old and still unmarried. Sasai kept a portrait of the legendary Japanese hero Yoshitsune in his room. The lieutenant did not abide by the requirements of the medieval caste system and paid no more attention to his appearance than the other pilots. This may seem like a small thing, but it was a gross violation of the Japanese officer's code of conduct. After arriving at Lei, I was surprised to notice that Sasasai showed great attention to the living conditions and health of his pilots. When one contracted malaria or some other tropical disease, including fungal diseases that literally ate people alive, Sasai was the first to come to the rescue. He cared for the pilot, tried to make him comfortable, and made a terrible fuss, demanding careful care from the hospital orderlies. To help his men, he did not hesitate to expose himself to the risk of contracting the worst diseases. To us, he has become a living legend. Men who did not hesitate to kill in battle blushed shamefully when they saw Sasasai's care. All of us were wholeheartedly devoted to the young officer. One night we were surprised to see Sasasai come to the hospital to sit beside a pilot who had contracted a fungus that covered his skin with painful sores. No one knew if the disease was contagious or not. One thing was clear, it was simply horrible. However Sasai came to the unfortunate man, he denied himself sleep, just to make the sick man better comfortable. All this was done in violation of the rigid caste system that reigned in the army. Here, the slightest deviation by a subordinate from the rules was considered a gross violation, and the commander could severely beat the offender or even shoot him. Even here in Lei, which was just a small frontline garrison lost in the jungle, a hierarchical system was strictly maintained. It was unthinkable not to give proper honours to officers. Sasazi's disregard for the caste system seemed especially strange, since he had graduated from Itajima, Japan's naval academy. Perhaps other officers resented his behaviour, I don't know. But Sasai often refused to live in the more comfortable officer's dormitory, spending most of his time with us. He took every measure to keep us from getting sick. One of the requirements of the medics at Lei was to take daily quinine pills as protection against malaria. Because of its horrible taste, Quinine was particularly hated by the pilots. But Sasai watched them like silly children, demanding that everyone swallow the medicine. As an example, he put a few pills in his mouth, chewed them, and even licked them. We all literally shuddered watching this. But Sasai didn't even blink. After that, no pilot dared to complain about the bitterness of quinine. When we were alone with Sasai, I marvelled aloud at his ability to chew quinine calmly. Sasai calmly explained, don't think I was pretending. I hate it just as much as the rest of you. But a person should try not to get malaria. Besides, I did the same thing my mother did for me when I was a child. During our conversations, Sasai told me about his childhood and how he was sick for a long time, being in bed for years. He said he cried and was cranky refusing to take his medications, and his mother tried to show that the drugs, absolutely necessary for a teenager, were supposedly delicious. Thanks to his mother's years of care, Sasasi's health gradually improved. He worked hard to toughen up his weak body, even though it meant agony and fatigue. In high school, no one would have guessed him as a former choker, he even became a judo champion. At the Naval Academy and Flight School, Sasai was one of the best cadets. After we had been in Lei for several months and the air battles became fiercer, our supplies began to dwindle. Although our regiment achieved brilliant successes, we never managed to neutralise the Allied aircraft. All increased the number of their aircraft. And given the ever-increasing aggressiveness of pilots, the Allied aircraft slowly turned into a formidable force. Their fighters and bombers flew day and night over the ocean and over the islands, hunting for our transports.
American submarines also contributed to the disruption of transportation. As a result, our ships were forced to hide during daylight hours and use the darkness to deliver supplies. But such transportation was always inadequate, and then even this thin trickle was cut off. In desperation, fleet commanders began using submarines to deliver supplies. It wasn't a bad compromise, given the difficulties, but the boats couldn't take much cargo on board. In the end, we were only delivered what was absolutely necessary for combat operations, so we had to forget all luxuries. Beer or cigarettes were given separately, but we never saw them anyway, except as a reward when our pilots achieved great successes without suffering casualties. Most pilots didn't, but we needed cigarettes, and we needed them desperately, because almost everyone was an avid smoker. It was the lack of cigarettes that annoyed the pilots the most. They were issued only in case of especially loud victories over the enemy. However, the caste system was strictly observed, which gave a lot of privileges to officers. The officers of the airfield services received their daily cigarettes. We cursed those clerical rats who never took to the air, but smoked whenever they wanted. And combat pilots were deprived of that simply because they were enlisted. Captain First Rank Saito usually inspected the barracks at the rank and file pilots once every two weeks. During these inspections, he would invariably forget his pack of cigarettes on his bunk or bench. Nishizawa usually took half of this find for himself and distributed the remaining cigarettes to the other pilots, but Saito came too infrequently. Finally, I lost patience and decided to take a desperate step. I sent my men into the village to the natives with orders to buy homemade cigars from them. We were strictly forbidden to smoke the local tobacco for fear that it might be laced with narcotics. After receiving a roll of disgusting smelling homemade cigars, I called the other pilots to the farthest corner of the airfield. They stared at me in amazement and hesitated, for they did not want to incur the wrath of their commander by disobeying a direct order. I'll take full responsibility and you smoke, I told them. Without saying a word, each pilot took a cigar. We smoked. I knew that if an officer noticed the group gathered, he would rush over immediately. And indeed, 15 minutes later, LT. Sasai came running in, who froze in amazement when he saw what we were doing. What are you guys doing? Are you out of your minds? Throw them out immediately. He shouted. He shouted. Several people jerked fearfully upon hearing Sasai's unaccustomed tone and threw the cigars to the ground. But Nishizawa and I did not, and continued to smoke defiantly. Sasai's eyes opened even wider at the sight of open defiance of the order. He asked, what's the matter with you? Do you know that smoking is a violation of an order? He asked exactly the question I expected to hear. I took a deep breath and told Sasai what I thought of a system that deprived combat pilots of tobacco, but allowed free smoking to officers who had never seen the enemy. Nishizawa stood nearby and remained silent as usual, but let out puffs of smoke. Sasai was angry. He pressed his lips together, his face darkening. The other officer wouldn't have hesitated, hitting me as hard as he could. I turned away from Sasai feeling guilty for being so boorish to a fine officer and took another deep drag. The other pilots looked at me and Nishizawa in horror. They had never seen such an open insult to an officer, never even heard of anything like it. Sasai walked away. A few minutes later we heard the crackle of our sedan's engine, and it, kicking up clouds of dust, flew toward our group at breakneck speed. With a squeal of brakes, the car came to a stop. Sasai irritably opened the door and pulled out two large duffel bags. Without saying a word, he untied the bags which were stuffed with blocks of cigarettes. Take them and divide them amongst yourselves. Just don't tell anyone where you got them from. As he drove away, he leaned out the car window and shouted, just throw those fucking cigars away. We called Sasai the Flying Tiger. This nickname had nothing to do with the name of the American volunteer group fighting in China. LT, Sasai always wore a belt with a large silver buckle engraved with a roaring tiger. Sasai's father, a retired captain of the first rank, made three buckles before the war and gave them as gifts one to Sasai, his only son, and the others to the husbands of his two daughters, lieutenant captains in the navy. According to Japanese legend, a tiger during the hunt can go 1,000 kilometers for prey 
but necessarily returns from the campaign. This was the hidden meaning of the engraving on Sasazai's buckle. Tasai was a talented pilot, but he had very few victories in April and may as a direct result of his lack of experience. Nishizawa, Ota, Takatsukai and I were determined to wait for Sasai's talent to unfold like a bud and blossom into a real ace. We arranged special courses to teach the lieutenant the finer points of air combat. We spent long hours in the barracks, explaining to him the mistakes he had made and telling him how to avoid them and surely achieve victory. Sasai had trouble determining his distance in combat, so we repeatedly set up practice bouts with him to train his eyesight. On May 12th, we had the opportunity to see how effective our lessons had been. It turned out that Sasai had learned the material perfectly. In one swift dive and climb run that took less than 20 seconds, he single-handedly scored three victories. As usual, we flew out to Port Moresby in the morning in a group of 15 zeros, built in five wedges. I spotted three Aerocobras a mile to our right and 1,500 feet below us. Their formation was quite unusual. The fighters were flying in column with 200-yard intervals between planes. I flew up to Sasazi's plane and pointed out the fighters. He nodded, and I gestured for him to come forward and attack. Then he waved his hand and smiled. We continued to fly on, and he turned steeply to the right and threw the plane into a dive. He shot up the lead Aerocobra on the first approach. His zero rained down on the unsuspecting enemy from above from behind. Sasai turned right, got close and opened fire with his cannons. His aim was excellent. The Aerocobra burst into flames and shattered into pieces right in the air. Sasai stopped diving and candled upward. Once 1,500 feet above the Americans, he performed a flip and attacked the second fighter. It sounds incredible, but the P-39 pilot continued to fly the same course. Sasai spun out of his favourable position, swerved slightly to the right to lie on the same course, and ripped the P-39 from tail to nose with a burst. The fighter jerked and went into a chaotic corkscrew, crashing into the ground. The pilot did not jump out, he was probably killed by the cannon burst. Sosai continued the attack in the same manner as before. He gained altitude and flipped to prepare for a third attack, but catching the last enemy pilot was not so easy. As soon as Sasai began to turn to the right, the nose of the cobra jerked up and the pilot tried to perform a loop, but it was too late. The American fighter was just starting to go up when Sasai put a burst of shells into its fuselage and left wing. The American plane could not withstand such a thing, as it was already experiencing overloads while doing a loop. The left wing flew off and the Aero Cobra fell into a flat corkscrew. The pilot was trapped. I was just amazed. Nishizawa grinned broadly as we got back into formation. Sasai had become an ace, achieving a hat trick in this battle. We were crossing the Owen Stanley Ridge with Sasasi's fighters well ahead of us when a single Aerocobra jumped out of the clouds and swooped down on his group. Never before had I regretted so much the lack of radios on our airplanes as I did at that moment. It was impossible to warn Sasai. Although my fighter could reach 300 mph with the afterburner on, I would not have had time to push the P-39 away. Fortunately for Sasai, the enemy pilot did not dare to attack from above. Instead, he decided to act in the manner of a submarine and strike from below and behind to strafe our planes while gaining altitude. I was 800 yards away when the P-39 went up to attack Sasai from below. In desperation, I squeezed the gun cocking, hoping that the shots would warn Sasai or scare the enemy pilot and cause him to abort the attack. The P-39 didn't flinch, but Sasai noticed the warning. Together with his wingmen, he immediately went upward, describing a dead loop. That was enough for the enemy pilot. With three O's in front of him and as many more catching up behind him, he realised he might be trapped. The P-39 began to turn around with an altitude gain, ready to go into a dive immediately. But now the initiative was on my side. With a U-turn, I threw the Zero into a dive, ready to catch the Aero Cobra as soon as it completed the turn and headed for the ground. But the pilot noticed me, went into a steep left turn, and began to dive. The high mountains blocked his path, and although he tried to get away from me, he was still forced to go up. This pilot's action was not bad. He glided down along the mountain slope, 
turned and lay down on the wing, dodging rocks, although I was hanging on his tail. But every time he turned, I was inside his turn and shortened the distance between the two airplanes. Every time the American thought he could slip away by turning left or right, he ran into my wingman Zero. Great guys. We caught the Aero Cobra and it was forced to fight. And the enemy made up his mind. More than once he made a sharp turn to go around the mountain, opening fire in the process. But each time in doing so I gained some more distance and finally came within firing distance. From a distance of 150 yards I began to give short bursts until I got close to 50 yards. But then the P-39 shrouded itself in black smoke and dived into the jungle. LT. Sasai felt ashamed the whole way back. My mechanics were looking at the bullet holes in the wings of my fighter when the lieutenant came over to apologise. He looked at the pierced wings and said nothing. 